I'd like to call the San Jose Charter Commission for April 19th up to order. And I'd ask the clerk to take the roll. Yeah, I'll start off with Barbara Marshman. Here. Christina Johnson. Here. Dan Bazzuto. Alma Kim absent. Elizabeth Monley. Elizabeth Monley, she'll be absent. Ellie Matsumura. Here. Thank you. Enrico Callender. Present. Frank Maitsky. Here. Garrick Percival. Here. George Sanchez. Present. Hui Tran. Him. Jeremy Barus, Jose Posadas, here. Lund Diab, present. Linda Lazat, here. Luis Barosio, here. Magnolia Siegel, here. Maria Fuentes, Sammy Robledo, here. Jerry Segura. T. Tran. Present. Veronica Amador. Here. Young Zhao. Here. And Frederick Ferrer. Here. Thank you. <laughs> Megan, do we have quorum? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. We have a quorum. Thank you. All right, um, I'll now take a motion for the consent calendar, which includes the minutes and the uh, acceptance of any letters from the public. Um, and can I get a motion for the to accept the consent calendar? Move approval. Second. Thank you. So Commissioner Lazat made the motion, Commissioner Marshman seconded. Uh, clerk will take the roll. Barbara Marshman? Yes. Christina Johnson? Yes. I'll call everyone who I marked absent just one more time to make sure. Dan Bazzuto? Absent. Elizabeth Monley? Just absent. Hmm. Ellie Matsumura? Yes. Enrico Callender? Aye. Frank Kamitsky? Yes. Garrick Percival? Yes. George Sanchez? Aye. Hui Tran? I'll mark him absent. Jeremy Barus? Jose Posadas? Yes. Len Diep? Aye. Linda Lazat? Yes. Luis Barosio? Yes. Magnolia Siegel? Yes. Maria Fuentes? Yes. Sammy Robledo? Yes. Yes. Jerry Segura? Yes. T. Tran? Yes. Veronica Amador? Yes. Young Zhao? Yes. And that motion passes, thank you. Thank you. Um, I just, I'm gonna move to reports and information. Um, the first report is uh, my report around, just as a feedback loop. Um, we got feedback last meeting from you around the reception of materials. So in meeting with staff and consultants this week, we were looking at what would be kind of a right rhythm of when we get materials to you and what materials we expect you to have reviewed or read or to make sure that you're um, giving some time to pre prepare for meetings. Um, so the, there's kind of three deadlines or three um, communication points that you should expect. First is the agenda of the email. That comes out the Monday before the meeting uh, with the agenda and any voting items. So that gets posted 
a week ago today. So a week before any meeting, you'll get the agenda and the, um, and the voting items that we're gonna take up. Secondly though, on Fridays um, noon, but at Friday noon before our meeting, any materials that we want you to read or be able to review, you'll receive then so that the Friday before, so last Friday at noon, we would send you any materials if we had materials that you needed to read or review. Um, anything after that we will hold because uh, just really understanding that folks can't receive things on the same day and, and, um, and be expected to uh, walk, walk through them. That gives the consultants and staff and myself time to get as many things done as we can before we send those out to you. So Friday at noon, um, uh, Megan will send out materials for you to read or review. And then the follow-up emails. So any um, items that are posted or follows up or um, uh, things that happen in a meeting. So somebody um, reports out presentations, things like that, that will come on the Wednesday after the meeting. So you'll get a, the Monday before a meeting, you get the um, minutes in the agenda. I'm sorry, the agenda and the, the items for voting the Friday afternoon before, you'll get reading materials and then the email follow-up on Wednesday after the meeting is any posted items and follow-up. So I'm hoping that that helps folks to get a clarity around when you're getting things and what you expect. Now, the, the, um, the part that's different for any of these is letters from the public and you will get those um, when we get them, uh, Megan will send them out. So for example, there was one today that she received, but again, that's just a matter of reception. So, um, and we don't have any, uh, the public can send notes to the commission anytime. We'll batch them and put them in uh, as well. So thank you for that um, request for clarity. I hope that helps. Um, and thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, definitely. And I, I appreciate the staff and consultants working with us to try to, to make those deadlines work for us. Okay, um, second item is the report from the clerk. Chair, excuse me one second. Were you gonna speak to the um, official commission emails? Um, I, I can, I thought that the clerk was gonna do that. Okay, great. If she doesn't, I will. Perfect, thanks. Tony? Is Tony on? Yeah, I just wanna get my video going. Um, so official, you have two emails. You have your personal email. You have official commission emails. Um, if you haven't signed into your official commission email, um, you need to work with us because we're required to send you our notices through the official city email for PRA purposes. Um, a lot of times, though, we may send it to both of your emails, so you're official just to make sure you see it but we're really supposed to only be using your official city email. Um, that's so if, um, if you leave and there's a PRA, like you next year, there's a PRA for emails, we have access to it. If we just use your personal, then we may have to go through your, have you go through your personal emails to look for things and we want to avoid that. Um, the other thing I wanna talk about is the live transcript. So um, I've enabled the closed captioning live transcript. So this is um, through Zoom. It's not a third, it's not our own 30, third party person and it's not a live person captioning. It's the Zoom software itself. So members of the public will get captioning via YouTube, but if they're um, signed into Zoom, they can go down to the bottom and um, enable that live transcript. And, and you guys can enable it. I've got it going right now. Um, you can drag it around too. You can put it at the top of your screen, the bottom of your screen, the side, it, it is movable. Um, you can also view the full transcript during the meeting um, off to the side as well. So if you have a hard time hearing who's speaking, it's kind of nice to have the full, and I'm pointing as if you can see my screen. Um, if you enable the full transcript, it'll show up on the side of your screen and it'll say who's speaking. So if you like heard a voice, but you don't like, wait, who said that? I can't, I can't tell because there's so many pictures. The full transcript will say who's speaking. And so we, we really like it and it's exciting. Oh, and your, um, your item is agendized for the next council meeting on April 27th. We'll probably talk about it under um, the work plan, but usually during the city clerk report, 
if you have anything going before council, I'll just announce the date um, under this report. So I just want to stay consistent with that. Thank you. Commissioner Monley, you had your hand up. You're on mute, Commissioner Monley. I go. just want to note that I am here. I've been here since the beginning. Uh, my my everything was disabled for me though. Got it back now, but I am here. Thank you, Commissioner Monley. If the Thank you. clerk will take record of that. Appreciate it. Um, yeah. And I'll let's do our new business. So I'm going to turn this over uh, to Lawrence to start our study session for tonight. Uh, you recall that tonight's discussion is about one of the main questions that the council has asked us to look at, which is the timing of district of the mayoral elections um, and the connection to the presidential election years. Um, you have received from Commissioner Pickle, I believe, the materials, and there's also a letter from the public that addresses this issue as well, um, or a blog post, I guess. Um, so I'll turn it over to Lawrence to introduce our, our guest tonight um, and lead us in our discussion. Thanks, Chair. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, glad to be back with you all. I'd like to introduce uh, our two speakers for this evening, um, both uh, uh, celebrated local academics from uh, San Jose State University, uh, the first of which is Terry Christensen. And he's a professor emeritus at San Jose State University, and his colleague, uh, Professor Mary Kern Percival, uh, who you might recognize uh, as a relation to one of the commissioners on this uh, commission. I will not name that commissioner. You'll have to figure it out yourself. Uh, but um, they are joining us to talk a little bit about, uh, as the chair said, um, the impact of timing of elections on governance in uh, San Jose, some of the changes that have happened over recent history, and uh, they're also going to present some data that um, P Commissioner Percival uh, had compiled with uh, his colleague, um, uh, Professor Kern Percival, uh, and they had shared that in a memo, but it gives a baseline for uh, election uh, turnout in, in um, presidential, gubernatorial, and, and uh, other years. So hopefully this uh, helps to dig into a part of the conversation that we haven't got into yet, which is that second bucket of election timing that the commission has been tasked with uh, thinking about and coming up with potential recommendations for. So uh, Professor uh, Christensen is gonna give a, a little presentation. Professor Curran Percival will jump in and then we'll have plenty of time for questions afterwards. So we'll just ask that you hold your questions until the presentation is over and then um, we'll, we'll uh, take a stack and, and see how long we can get with the conversation. With that, I'll hand it over to Professor Christensen. Um, <clears throat> so Lawrence, I think some wires got crossed here because I thought you asked me to talk about the relationship between the mayor and the council, and that's uh, mainly yes. what I prepared. Great, fantastic. And that was, that was actually uh, part of it as well. Sorry for skipping it. Um, if we look back to the work plan, uh, we have the role of districts, how council members are elected and their role relative to a mayor with more consolidated power as well as the timing of elections and the impact on governance. So Terry, we're, we're all good. My, my apologies for misspeaking. Um, uh, please go ahead. Okay, uh, so hello to all of you. There's several friends and a few former students on, on this commission. I'm really proud to see you all serving and thank the rest of you uh, for your work. Um, before I start, just a couple of key questions. You've heard these all of these before, but just to reiterate, as you do this, you need to be thinking about what problems you're trying to solve. I know you've talked about equity, transparency, campaign finance, police accountability, community engagement, and others. Some of those are susceptible to, to addressing in a charter and others are not. So my second point would be, think about what you actually need to put in a charter and what's not necessarily to be necessary to be in a charter. Because once something's in a charter, it's, it's more rigid <clears throat> and it becomes more difficult to change. So I think something like campaign finance is more appropriately dealt with by council action than by charter revision. And the last point I would make in general is, I know you had an expert here talking about the, a model charter, but you're not writing a model charter for all cities. You're writing a charter for this specific city. And that's why you're on the charter commission because you know this specific city and you need to be thinking about what changes, if any, we need to make in our city charter to make San Jose work better uh, for as many people as possible, everybody, if possible, but as many 
if possible. <clears throat> so a little bit about the role of the council in relation uh, to the mayor. There's been a gradual shift in that relationship, a shift in power from council towards, uh, towards the mayor. Uh, uh, from 1916 to 1967, we had no elected mayor at all. There wasn't anybody, even anybody with the title of mayor till 1948. During that time, uh, whoever was acting as the chair of the city council, president of the council and mayor was simply a member of the council serving by rotation selected by members of uh, the other members of the council. There were then seven members uh, of the council, all elected citywide or at large. So basically a council of equals. That began to shift in 1967 with the first significant charter reform that you've heard about already, I know. And that's the first directly elected mayor, um, <clears throat> serving alongside six colleagues also elected citywide. So the mayor's elected citywide, so is the entire city council. So now the mayor becomes something like the first among equals, has a title, but actually no additional power. The charter that was written in 1965 and created the first directly elected mayor designated the mayor as, quote, the political leader, unquote, of the city. Chuck Davidson, who really passed, recently passed away, was on that charter revision commission. Uh, and here's what he said about the meaning of that phrase, political leader. Chuck said, we give you all the power that you have the leadership ability to take. If you don't have that ability, we're not going to give it to you by charter. If you don't have that ability, we're not going to give it to you by charter. So his argument was, by political skill, a mayor needs to assert leadership over the city. If a mayor can't do that, doesn't have that political skill, it's not going to come from the charter. This is the choice you face now, should some of that power actually come from the charter. <clears throat> That's all changed a little bit over time with uh, subsequent actions. For example, the shift to district elections meant that council members were elected not all citywide, but by district. So now representing about 100,000 people each as compared to the mayor who represents a million people. That in itself is an enhancement of the, of the role of mayor, if not the authority, uh, and, and, and in a sense, an enhancement of the power of the mayor. Representing and speaking for a million people, also having access through the media uh, to a million people that most individual council members by district simply don't have because they don't get the kind of attention uh, that the mayor does. That's an enhancement of, of the power uh, of the mayor. And uh, so with district elections, we see a little more of a shift towards stronger leadership, a role for, uh, for the mayor. Around this time also, Mayor Janet Gray Hayes took a couple of powers for the mayor that aren't in the charter, and they were nominating the vice mayor and naming members of council committees. That's changed over time. Both of those go to the full council now, but the mayor still initiates that. That's a little bit extra power because the mayor can, can, uh, can reward and encourage some uh, close allies or can help win over allies with council appointments or maybe with an appointment to be vice mayor. Small thing and not in the charter, uh, but a little bit of an enhancement of the power of the mayor. And then in 1986 was Measure J, which you've heard about before, and that gave the mayor the role of, of proposing the budget, nominating the city manager subject to council approval, overseeing the Office of Public Information, a very important visibility uh, uh, access for the mayor, and with the council approving manager appointees to department heads. So gradual increases in the power of the mayor, but mostly informal. And mostly it's from public focus on the mayor. The public, as Ron Gonzalez has told you, other mayors will tell you, the public assumes the mayor has power because the mayor's the mayor. And they don't know the details that you know now, if you didn't already, I'm sure you did, uh, as Charter, Charter Revision Commission. Members. So there's the assumption of power. That in itself is a power. If people think you have power, you kind of do have power. Unfortunately, for mayors who want to have power, council members don't always agree with that public perception. So council members are a little more reluctant to cede power to the mayor. But it is a factor. So basically, uh, 
we've had an evolving system gradually in, increasing and enhancing the power and the role of the mayor. And uh, contrary to what my friend from North Carolina said, and I'm a, an alumnus of the same program uh, she was in, she is in, um, San Jose is a hybrid form of government. It's not pure council manager, it's just not. Uh, it's, 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 it's a hybrid because the role of the mayor has evolved and expanded. And actually most council managers systems don't even elect their council by district. So in that sense, we're a bit of a hybrid and we were ahead of the curve of other cities making those changes. San Jose is over a million population now. We're the 11th largest city in the United States. Austin just grew beyond us. Um, and as cities grow larger and become more diverse, the politics of those cities tend to become more complex. Divisions increase, factions emerge, <clears throat> conflict becomes more common. Think of San Francisco, think of Chicago, think of Los Angeles, think of New York. We have factions and we have conflict in San Jose, but it's nothing like as rigid uh, or, as, or, or as, uh, as powerful as the kind of factions and conflicts that are commonly seen in these other large cities. We're maybe evolving in that direction, uh, but we're not there as yet. Well, when there's that kind of conflict and that, that, those kinds of factions, political leadership becomes much more important because political leadership can resolve the conflict. A mayor can pull together a governing coalition of, of, of enough factions to have a majority, a majority and to rule. And, uh, and, uh, and carry policy, public policy forward. But to do that, the mayor needs some actual authority over hiring of department heads and over the budget. So the question before you, I think, is, whether San Jose is at that point now that we need that kind of leadership or whether the current system still works reasonably well uh, for this community. If we move to a mayor council form, power shifts even more to the mayor, the lines of accountability become much more clear to the public and to the voters. We don't just think the mayor's in charge, the mayor actually is in charge. This is subject to a counterbalance by the council. The council is still there. The council still has a role to play, but a shift to a mayor council form shifts power towards the mayor and away from the council. So you need to be thinking about that balance of power. How much, how much power do you want to have the council, the council to have in relation to the mayor? How much do you want to see shifted to stronger executive leadership? If you do shift to a, a council manager form of government, there are ways to maybe mitigate the powers uh, given to the mayor. Uh, for example, you don't have to give the mayor veto power. Uh, the mayor of Oakland doesn't have veto power. You don't have to give the mayor thorough veto power. There are cities where the mayor doesn't have veto power over land use. Not sure quite, quite sure what the rationale about that is, but uh, the veto, there's a, there's a range of veto power that you can give. The maximum is to give line item veto, and that enables a mayor to uh, veto not just entire pieces of legislation by the legislative body, the city council, but to veto individual segments. And maybe it's a budget line item, maybe it's a, a one part of, a, uh, a, of an ordinance. Um, Veto generally takes two thirds to override. You could leave it a simple majority. You could leave it a slightly greater than simple majority, 60% uh, instead of 67%. So uh, that's, that's another way to do it. Uh, I think it could be important if you move to a council mayor form of government to provide uh, a budget analyst for the council. Uh, San Diego does that. San Diego is actually a good model for you all to look at. It's a fairly recent change over to strong mayor form of government. They're only on their second uh, elected strong mayor. The first served two terms and the, and the second one is in his, in his first term. So how it's working out for San Diego, which is a similar a city, quite similar to San Jose in a lot of ways. That could be a good, good thing for you all to look at. But a budget analyst uh, for the council, that, the, you know, the state legislature has a legislative analyst that looks at the governor's budget proposals. So the state legislature has its own expertise. 
And then you should also consider the place of the city attorney in relation to the council and the mayor. You don't want a city attorney who's working for one or the other, just the mayor, but a city attorney, as Mark Vanny said last week, a city attorney that represents the city uh, and not just individuals and not, not just the mayor. Other cities, Oakland elects the city attorney, San Diego elects the city attorneys. There are some problems with that, I think, but there are various ways of doing that. But you should also think about legal advice that's available to the council and or to the mayor uh, that's uh, uh, not biased towards one or the other, or if it is, well, no, let's leave it at that. Uh, so that's a little bit about uh, mayor council. I'm gonna address election timing just briefly because I wanna leave Mary plenty of time uh, to talk about the actual data that she and, uh, and Garrick have collected. But basically there's simply no question that scheduling an election of mayor in presidential years will result in more voter participation. How much? That's a question, but it will be more. It could be as much as 30 or 40%. That's a lot more. Mary will give you some specific figures in just a minute. The thing about higher voter turnout elections though is, though is that it's not just greater numbers. It's a different electorate. It includes more voters who are young, more voters who are renters, more people of color, more people who are not native born, more people with lower incomes and less education. It's a much more diverse election electorate and it's much more representative of the total, uh, total population. And that different electorate could produce different outcomes because those folks I just mentioned may vote differently from the fo folks who vote in virtually uh, every election. They're probably gonna be more liberal, uh, for example. Um, campaigns and candidates would have to pay more attention to these voters. Uh, a lot of campaigns, most campaigns, don't pay a lot of attention to infrequent voters because they have limited funds to invest. They're gonna send it to people like probably all of us on, 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 this, on this Zoom screen right now who are regular reliable voters who they know are gonna vote. And most campaigns don't have the resources to reach out beyond that to the less reliable voters. And if those voters aren't reached out to, of course, it's even less likely that they'll vote. So campaigns sometimes, most of the time, reinforce uh, the turnout phenomenon amongst the, the, the groups of people I just talked about. If those people are participating though, maybe elected officials would talk about rent control in a different way if more renters are voting. Maybe, maybe they would talk about climate change in a different way, take it more seriously, if more young people were voting, since that's such an important issue to young people. So it can change what campaigns do, what campaigns talk about, and ultimately what elected officials do. That's with more people voting and a more representative uh, electorate. I'm gonna stop there uh, and let Mary uh, give you her data and then we'll have a chance to talk more with questions. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Um, I, Lawrence, do you have the ability to share your screen with the memo with the table? Yeah, I can. And let me pull that up. If you could that just, would be uh, yeah. Really helpful. I know you all have the memo, but uh, if we're all looking at it at the same time, that would be really helpful. Okay. Just give me a moment. Sure, and I could just get started uh, right away. Uh, just in context, the data that um, Garrick and I put together, we are comparing the turnout in the mayoral races, uh, in the mayoral elections. So these are held in gubernatorial years, as um, Terry mentioned, to a citywide election in a presidential year. So what is turnout in a citywide race? So we're not comparing it to district races. Thank you very much. So we are comparing it to a citywide race. So as you can see, this uh, the table, so 2020, this um, first, the total votes, 391,371 votes. Um, this, the, the race here, this is measure G, this was the um, expansion of the police, independent police auditor oversight authority. So this is a race that everyone in the city had the opportunity to participate in. The reason we're comparing the mayoral elections to the citywide measures is because 
it's essentially apples to apples, citywide races. And so 73.8%. And I'll elaborate a little bit on uh, what we estimate turnout would be if we change the timing of election, because that's the question that the commissioners are looking at. What would can we estimate turnout would be if you change the timing of the mayoral election to presidential years? So in 2018, you have total votes cast for mayor, 159,323. So turnout, 37.6%. And so you can compare these going down the way. So 2016, this is uh, Measure G, the business tax. Um, that's the citywide measure that we can compare. So again, 69.4%. We can compare that to the 2014 mayoral race, which turnout was 43.4%. And then going down, you know, comparing these citywide races to mayoral elections. And you can see in presidential years, citywide elections, a citywide election turnout is in many cases substantially higher. Um, so one of the things that Garrick and I also did was we actually averaged, let me grab my notes here really fast. We actually averaged the differences between the presidential years and the corresponding mayoral years. And then we added those all up and then divided by the four election cycles. And we found that on average, it was an increase over these, you know, between 2006 and 2020, an increase of about 28%. So, you know, if you were to use this as a measure of what we could expect voter turnout to be, the increase in voter turnout, if you were to change the timing of the mayoral elections to presidential years using current numbers, so current registration numbers, which are um, about, let me double check, 500, I believe it's about 529,000, you can expect a pretty substantial increase. You can expect uh, somewhere between 148 and 169,000 additional voters for mayor, additional votes for mayor. So somewhere between 28 and 33%. That's a pretty substantial increase. And as Terry mentioned, it's not just numbers, it's the diversity of this electorate. You wouldn't just have more voters you would have younger voters, you would have more voters of color, you would have more voters who have lower levels of income. And so the mayor would be voted by, voted, elected by a more diverse electorate. And so this is the person who represents the entire city, the only person who, um, you know, the, the council, as you know, they're elected by district. So this is a person who represents the entire million person population. And so one would expect that policy might also be more representative. So I know that some of the questions that have been raised by um, very smart individuals, concerns about, you know, would the, would the mayoral election get drowned out by the presidential election? Uh, there are concerns about ballot roll off. And these are really important considerations I absolutely ask you to spend time considering. There is, um, definitely concerned about um, information. And there is some research that shows that um, these elections don't get drowned out by presidential elections. Um, people, a lot of it depends on uh, how much attention the media pay to it. So we would definitely urge the local media to spend a great deal of attention to mayoral elections. But also, you're going to have voters who are able to spend more time on these elections. You're going to have certainly a lot of um, interested parties who are going to pay more attention to these mayoral elections, a lot of get out the vote folks who are going to pay a lot more attention because the, vote, the elections are going to be much more easily accessible. We know, for instance, that voters don't have encyclopedic information even about presidential elections. The other thing I wanted to address briefly was a uh, ballot roll off. Garrick and I really quickly did some numbers, uh, the difference in ballot roll off between 2020 and 2018. And quickly, I'm sorry, ballot roll off is when you have folks who vote for offices at the top of the ticket. So presidential races in or the presidential race in 2020. So they cast a vote for president and then don't cast a vote for something lower down the ticket. So for instance, measure G or 
something else lower down the ticket. And that is absolutely a phenomenon that is seen. Uh, it's a problem in all sorts of races. So statewide ballot propositions, uh, judicial elections, we absolutely see ballot roll off. And so we compared the ballot roll off in 2020 and 2018, and there was not a substantial difference. The ballot roll off for measure G and the ballot roll off in the mayor mayoral election. I think it was 108 in 2020 and 10.4 in 2018. But again, we calculated these pretty quickly. Um, but we've also done this previously, looking, comparing the presidential elections in 2016, 2012, 2008, and compared them to the corresponding mayoral elections. And we didn't find a substantial difference. It's a couple of percentage points, but it's not a huge difference. So it's definitely something you guys should take into consideration, but we're comparing ballot roll-off between the citywide election for these um, city measures and the citywide election for the mayor's race. We're not comparing any other ballot roll-off because it makes sense to compare a citywide election to a citywide election. Um, but I'm happy to take any questions about these particular data and just the, the you know, the research in general on the timing of elections, but I think Terry did a really, really nice job summarizing that. I see a number of hands. Great, thank you, Professors Christensen and Karen Percival. Um, before we jump in, um, when you talk about ballot roll off, is that what some other people would call the undervote, um, similar terms? Yeah, and so undervote also includes when people, when um, they just, like if uh, if your vote is not discernible, so maybe it's a conscious decision not to vote in an election, but yes, your vote and ballot roll up are generally considered the same thing. Okay, I asked that because um, the memo um, from commission, uh, Planning Commissioner Allen that was sent in referenced under votes. Just wanted to make sure that yeah. um, we're speaking on the same terms there. So, I hope he was referring to the same thing. Yes. Great. Uh, so I saw a couple hands shoot up around the same time, so I'm going to get us started with Commissioner Bruce, and then we'll go Lazat, Barosio, and Marshman. Thanks, Lawrence. Yeah. I would just like to notify the chair that I am present. I am uh, attending this meeting late, but if the minutes could reflect I took my seat at 635, it would be much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Lazat. Thank you, uh, Terry, so very nice to see you. Um, Professor, thank you for your uh, comments. I just had a question on comparing the, um, the, the citywide measure to a citywide uh, mayor race. Um, and, and I look at the citywide measure as being a one issue that people are, are only concerned about. Whereas a mayor's race, there's a lot of issues involved in you know who that candidate would be and do you think that that is um, relevant to your hopes that um, by moving the mayor's race we would see such a big uptick I think you said you know 20 20 to 30 percent I mean I see more people being being engaged in a one issue than than you know trying to trying to decipher between you know two people's varying views on something in the mayor's race. I'm going to let Mary take that really, but uh, in general, the drop, I call it drop off rather than roll off or, or undervote, but it's the, we're talking about the same phenomenon. In general, the drop off is greater from candidates to ballot measures uh, of a variety of sorts. So I think, I, 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 it, uh, of course, we can't compare these data because there are different election cycles and mayor's not on the ballot and so on. Um, and actually, I don't think drop off is necessarily a bad thing. Uh, if people don't think they know enough to vote for something, that's fine, whether that's for mayor or for uh, or on a ballot measure. So um, I, I, I'm slightly encouraged by, uh, by those numbers, given that uh, some folks in the League of Women Voters, for example, have argued that uh, we'd have less informed uh, voters if if we if we make this shift. But uh, let uh, let's go let's go to Mary uh, on this one. That um, your first point was the same point that I was going to make. We think our estimates are actually um, pretty conservative, 
because statewide ballot measures and citywide measures tend to have lower turnout because it is only one thing. People have to be pretty knowledgeable about it. Um, voters tend to be less knowledgeable about these things. So comparing a mayor's race, um, mayor's races, city council races, these tend to have higher turnout because they deal with so many more issues and people are more knowledgeable about it and more engaged in it. Okay. Then why is there so much uh, 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 roll off in, in council races? Um, you know, even, even in the district. I mean, that's, that's people aren't engaged. Uh, yeah, and that's abs that's absolutely true, and and uh, and it's appalling and upsetting. But uh, it's even more difficult for council members to cut through uh, all the campaign campaigning that's going on, whether it's statewide or, or 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 presidential. It's a lower profile. It's a smaller number of people that are uh, that are being that the media are that the campaigns are attempting to reach, and there's much much less help from the media. Uh, on on that uh, big decline in local coverage by uh, media of, of of virtually all sorts, except a little bit better online coverage. Um, but council races are the ones that are covered the least. Mayors' races get covered more. Uh, mayoral candidates are going to spend three to five million dollars uh, on campaigns. A lot of television advertising. City council, district council races, as you well know, having run two of them. Uh, just can't do that. You don't have the money and it's way too expensive uh, for that. So council members, council candidates have to find other ways of, uh, of getting through. Okay, I'm going to move us on to, thank you, uh, thank you Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Brosio. Perfect, thank you. Uh, thank you, professors, for your time and uh, sharing your expertise and passions with us. Uh, it's very much appreciated. Um, I have a question. Uh, Professor Christensen, um, you mentioned something, um, and I just uh, would love um, a little bit more detail on it. Um, you said as, as cities grow, uh, you've observed that political leadership becomes more important. Um, and I miss the connection you made with hiring department heads. If you can say a little bit more about that phenomenon that you see or that observation. Uh, sure. So, uh, well, let's take uh, police accountability. It's been an issue in San Jose since 1971, at least. First council member meeting I ever went to was a protest about a shooting of a black IBM worker by a cop. Uh, and uh, the constituents, the city, the, the community wanted something done. But the council essentially could do nothing, um, and, and nor could the mayor. Uh, mayors in those big cities can fire police chiefs. Uh, they can make things happen. They may still be constrained by union contracts that the police unions negotiate, but um, they have more authority to actually do something. Uh, and communities sometimes really want to see something, something move, see some heads roll. Um, and you have seen uh, quite a few police, <laughs> police chiefs uh, resign uh, rather than be fired around the city, not in San Jose, uh, but around the country, I meant. Um, so uh, uh, it, it really is an accountability uh, question. People expect the mayor to be able to do that. And then when the mayor can't, people are frustrated by that. And so are mayors who don't have that authority. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I got Commissioners Marshman, Diep. Fuentes, Tran, and Matsumura. Commissioner Marshman. Hi, Terry. Um, I'm going to ask you for an opinion if you feel prepared to do it. If you don't, I'll understand. But um, you talked about cities reaching a point that they need to make some changes. And interestingly, Norberto Duenas, former city manager, implied in a visit at the last meeting that that you know he thought maybe San Jose could use some tweaking here. Do you feel we are at the point that we could not go to full uh, you know San Francisco uh, powerful mayor but uh, but start to move the needle a little bit uh, 
and if so, if you'd like to talk about how much, I mean, it's, um, want to comment on that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I favored strong mayor form of government for most of my career, which is huh. teaching uh, local government and local politics. I was <laughs> trained in North Carolina at Chapel Hill, as I said, the same as my colleague who spoke to you. Uh, and I've, I've been biased in that direction uh, for a long time. But honestly, right now, I'm not so sure. Um, I also don't want to see the powers of the council diminished. So I think I can go along with Norberto, who's a San Jose State political science alumnus, I might add. Uh, I could go along with Norberto that uh, some tweaking is in order, um, but be careful with your tweaks. Because uh, I don't want to see the, the powers of the council diminish. The council uh, and a district council is really the main point of access to what local government does for communities, for neighborhoods, for citizens. They're, they're, they're the folks who are on the front lines and to whom we have the most access and over whom, at least theoretically, we have the most influence. So I don't want to see the role of the council diminished uh, significantly. But on the other hand, uh, I understand when Sam Licardo is frustrated uh, with the expectations uh, of him as mayor when he really doesn't have the authority to, uh, uh, to meet those expectations for people. So, sorry, that was a really wishy-washy answer, Barbara, uh, <laughs> but I, I guess my views are evolving. It really wasn't wishy-washy. <laughs> Thank you, Terry. It was really helpful. Well, uh, Commissioner Marshman, way to put our guests on the hot seat. But <laughs> Uh, please keep the good questions coming. Uh, Commissioner Diep. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have two speakers. I have two questions. Um, <laughs> Professor Christensen, right. uh, if I could just invite you to uh, thank you for that presentation. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, if, if you could maybe uh, elaborate a bit on, um, you mentioned the role of the council and the role of the mayor and the powers between, but there's a, I think there's a role uh, that this commissioner should consider and that's of, of city staff. Um, you know, how long they take to do things and what they present back to the council. You know, whenever I ask questions to previous uh, speakers, they, they've kind of driven back at me that, you know, a council should infight, a council should work together. And I, and I agree. Um, consensus and, and, and you know, um, back and forth. But then there are the constraints of the Brown Act, where in a 12-hour meeting, you know, you, you can't really, really take four hours or five hours to hash out one particular uh, policy item because there's an agenda of, of 10 items and you know you can press the button to speak but I found that if I press the button to speak more than twice I got dirty looks so you know you can't speak and and deliberate outside of the public purview and then you have the constraints of a 10 12 hour council meeting to you know go in depth uh, that's it's really rare that you're going to get the the elected leaders um, honing and crafting policy we depend a lot on city staff and you know who controls the staff, the department heads, and all that. So if you could just pontificate on that. And for uh, Professor, I'm sorry, I didn't catch your, your first part of your last name, but Percival, um, oh, current Percival, um, if you could comment a bit on, I, I don't d d dispute, there's no disputing that the fact uh, that turnout is higher in, in presidential year elections. Um, and I think as a, a political matter, the council as it is right now is, is you know, is going to go that direction. Um, I think when I was on the council, we had that debate and, and you know, the votes are there for that. Uh, but if we're going to discuss it as a, I guess, a, a qualitative matter, um, I mean, I, I do have questions about the, the quality, the quote unquote quality of the votes. How informed are the votes? If you have four forms and you just kind of check down just XO, 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 do we want to kind of inject this I don't know what to call it, but there's this kind of people who really care about who they're voting for, and then there are people who have something in front of them and just kind of mark the ballot. Um, we can talk about ballot roll off, but I, I think in that environment where the power goes or the influence goes is to special interests, to you know, um, editorial boards of papers, of unions, of chambers of commerce, who of police, uh, you know, groups who send out you know voter guides. And so if if you're not informed about something, you might just say, okay, I'm a member of this group or that group and that affiliation, and I'm just going to look at this and just go down what is recommended. These are the endorsed candidates. And I don't know if that's good for democracy overall. I, I get that the turnout issue is important. You want a diverse electorate, but at the same time, I personally don't see what the 
what the constraint is on the electorate in a non-presidential year election. We're, we're not. Thank you, Commissioner Jib. I want to get to the answers of the questions. Sure. I encourage everybody to keep their questions short, and uh, if our speakers could keep the answers succinct. We have a lot of other commissioners that have questions, too. I want to make sure everyone gets their time. Thank you. Okay, so starting with uh, Lung's first question uh, about uh, the council actually being able to assert, assert authority, uh, that's a huge challenge. And of course, Lundeep speaks with, uh, experience, from experience uh, at doing that. Uh, I, I think council needs to look more at its own organization. There should not be 12 hour meetings. You can't, you're gonna have to, the council is gonna have to start meeting more than one day a week. Uh, I think the committee structure can be strengthened and that's important. I think the staffing for council members can be strengthened and that's important is giving council backup. Uh, council members write memos. Uh, you can write more memos. I know the Brown Act keeps you from talking to each other, but I know uh, there, there are also a bunch of memo writers on. On, on the council. So that's another way to do it. Um, so I, I think that it, it really is up to the council to figure out ways that they can be more effective at, uh, at, at asserting their views. And, and uh, I, I get what you're saying about uh, those long meetings and, and the frustration of trying to make a point when everybody's already fed up with hearing points from the other nine council members. Uh, so I think that's really a matter of council organization, council staffing, support for council. For I mentioned a legislative analyst to help the council with budget process. Those kinds of things could, could be helpful. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you for your question. Um, it's it's a good point. So we're concerned about um, if we don't if voters aren't turning out in the uh, mayoral race when it's held in the gubernatorial election. Um, and we want to increase turnout, what's the quality of the vote, essentially, if they weren't already turning out previously. So we don't really have um, knowledge tests, we don't really have any tests to in elections to make sure voters, you know, quote, know enough to vote. We don't do that. Um, we stopped doing that a long time ago, 1965 Civil Rights Act, we stopped doing stuff like literacy tests. Ideally, we want folks to be very knowledgeable about civics and government, but you know, busy voters don't have time to have encyclopedic information about elections. There's all sorts of ways that rational voters make really good decisions. Um, I've got a billion, not a billion, I have several books uh, written by uh, professors that I had actually at UCSD who have done a lot of studies showing that there are endorsements, there are newspaper endorsements, interest group endorsements, um, all sorts of other things that help, you know, they serve as what we call information shortcuts that substitute for larger amounts of information. Um, and, you know, ideally we would want groups, we would want the media to help increase the amount of civic information that people have, especially nowadays. But we're pretty confident that voters can make good choices. And I don't mean good, like in some normative way, but good, like matching their own political interests without being super knowledgeable, like super encyclopedic knowledgeable. Um, so the other thing is, is yeah, turnout would be higher. We're pretty confident that these voters could still make rational decisions. The other thing I was going to mention too, is that we're going to have turnout that's higher and it's going to, we're going to have these presidential elections that are going to get people pretty excited about elections. And that's going to get pretty people pretty excited about the mayoral election as well. So you're going to have a lot of groups that are going to get involved in local elections, stimulate people's interests in local elections. And that's a really good thing, given how much is tied to local elections. I always encourage my students, please vote in the local elections. There's so much that affects you on a daily basis, like public safety and planning and land use. We really want you guys to get involved in this and not just focus on the state elections and the presidential elections. But I think it's a, a thing you guys absolutely have to consider. Thank you. So I have uh, Commissioners Fuentes, Tran, Matsumura, Sanchez, Siegel, and then Marshman again. So Commissioner Fuentes. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, welcome, uh, Mary and Terry. Thank you for being here with us tonight. And Mary, um, your data is excellent. It was very helpful to understand the impact of the mayor, I mean, the presidential versus the other cycle on turnout and, and uh, well, on turnout. 
So my question is back to the, um, Terry, to the question of a strong mayor. And um, I, you know, part of what I think that um, is our charge is to really be looking out for democracy. That's one of the things that I, that I learned from other uh, speakers who talked about past charter reviews and, and being concerned with that and um, wanting to have a, a more democratic um, city was the reason that we, we got um, the, um, one of the reasons that we have um, the district elections. So thinking, and also I like the quote that you said about from uh, Chuck Davidson, where a mayor is as strong as his political skills. So just because um, any mayor feels that frustrated or can't do what they wanna do, doesn't necessarily mean that we need to change the charter. It could mean that the person needs to, you know, be stronger politically, they can, you know, develop those skills if they don't have them. But more important is, do you, when, when you say you're in favor, um, generally have been in favor of a strong mayor, what do you think about our city? Because our city is what it is in terms of the, the strength of the mayor. And we have a very strong, and I would say robust um, district um, council member seats and in our communities benefit from that. So in other cities where um, it seems that a strong mayor is more advantageous, do they have district elections and how does it, how does it work? Is, that, my, is my question clear, what I'm trying to oh, say? Yeah, uh, uh, yes, I, th I think so. Yes, all of those cities have district elections. Okay. All of them have district elections. Okay. Some of them have much larger city councils that are like New York, Chicago. I think New York's 90, Chicago's 50, LA's 15. Well, a larger city council provides more direct representation for more people. And those larger councils are organized more like legislative bodies, like a state legislature or like a federal legislature with stronger committees, different leadership structure uh, and so on. So it, it's, 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 it's different in those large cities. But I think Chicago and, and New York are outliers with the, the total number of council members, but they're all elected by district. San Francisco elected by district. Uh, they chose that before we did in San Jose. Then you may remember, Maria, they changed their minds. The voters changed their minds and went back to at-large district elections and then changed their minds again. Mm -hmm. uh, so they've had district elections just a little bit uh, less long than, uh, than we have. I think thinking about the, the, the role of the mayor, um, you know, democracy is about accountability too. And how do you hold somebody accountable for something they, they don't have the authority to do? So if you're really unhappy with the mayor's action on police accountability, how do you hold him accountable? Uh, he can't actually do anything except what you said a few minutes ago, uh, quoting Chuck Davidson, uh, provide a leadership role on the city council to move the council as a whole in a certain direction. Firing a police chief is a, is a very tough thing uh, to do for a, legislative, for a legislative body. They have to persuade the city manager uh, to do it, but that's possible. All right, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Tran. Uh, Commissioner Tran, you're muted. It's your turn for a question. You're still muted. Okay, I'm gonna come back to you. Um, uh, Commissioner Matsumura. Thank you. Um, a couple of items. One, just, just quickly sort of on the, the concern that the votes in, in presidential election years, which we've established the voters who are turning out there and, and not in gubernatorial years are um, predominantly people of color, uh, low income, younger voters, to refer to those as lower quality votes, to say there's a qualitative difference or that they're less informed is essentially saying that those voters 
have lower quality opinions or are less informed. Now, I, I don't want to say that's what Commissioner Yep was saying, because I think he's just reflecting back an argument that has been made. But I, I do want to just quickly make that point because that's a very concerning argument for me and I hope we'll all be keeping that in mind if that argument comes up again, that it raises major equity concerns, which we've committed to as a commission. Um, Understood, but I would appreciate you. if you could keep it to questions um, because I want to make sure yep. I want to so held everyone, I, held everyone accountable to the same <laughs> non-proselytizing uh, proselytizing, um, standard. So uh, if you have a question, love to hear that. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you to the presenters. Um, both for, for really helpful presentations. Um, and I did have a follow-up on, on the, the mayor council. So, um, Terry, you had talked about, okay, there's, you know, you hit a point where you need stronger political leadership. So I'm wondering if you can drill down for us sort of what are the indicators of the type of dysfunction that, that you would say we need stronger political leadership versus other kinds of solutions? And then, you know, you were careful to say political leadership and that you've been talking about powers of the mayor versus powers of the council. So indicators of need for stronger political leadership and indicators that you need a stronger mayor versus a council, for example, that's able to fire the police chief. Because I can only think of, you know, if you have a decision that needs to be made in less than 24 hours, then perhaps you're looking to a mayor versus council. But, but what else would help us assess needing a stronger mayor versus stronger council? Well, the main indicators are, are something like political deadlock, uh, where agreement just can't be reached, where, where issues fester and fester and fester indefinitely because agreement can't be reached, because there's deep factionalism on the city council, because there's a mayor who, for whatever reason, can't pull uh, the, votes, the votes together and can't take action with, with mayoral authority. So it, we're not there yet, fortunately. Uh, some people think we're getting closer to that, but but we're not we're not there in San Jose, uh, where there's where there's direct uh, where there's considerable deadlock uh, in uh, in 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 action. Uh, but but that's that's what you should be looking for, and that's that's what tends to evolve as big cities uh, grow and become more diverse, and the diversity gets expressed as factions in politics, and the factions get into conflict and. Uh, and and uh, uh, the result is the result is deadlock. Executive authority can cut through that. Uh, skillful council organizing can cut through that. Um, but it's just particularly at that point that stronger leadership, I think, in the form of a, of an empowered mayor, is necessary. When you get to that point. All right. Thank you. So I've got. Um... Commissioners Tran, Sanchez, uh, Commissioner Bruce, I saw your hand up earlier and now it's back up again, so I'm going to insert you there, and then Siegel and Meitsky. So, uh, Commissioner Tran. We're still having a hard time hearing you, unfortunately. Um, if um, you want to respond to um, Megan uh, via email, um, we can take a question that way. Uh, happy to do that. Um, or if you can, I'll keep coming back to you if you get your audio worked out. Uh, fortunately, I don't have a chat, so can't take it that way. Um, Commissioner Sanchez. Uh, yes, uh, thank you to both of you for the information that you, you brought us the, this evening. And this is a question for uh, Professor Christensen. Um, you had mentioned earlier in your remarks uh, regarding uh, San Diego, uh, having gone to a strong mayor uh, type of government governance, uh, and I was going to ask you, do we know, I, I know it's early on, they just, what, two years ago, that they, they, they've changed. Do you see or, or do you know of any advantages that, that have come about uh, or situations where, where that's helped the, the city of San Diego uh, being as large as they are uh, in terms of, of moving in that direction versus what they had before? I haven't followed it closely enough to, to say, George. Sorry. Okay. That's okay. And um, I'll be talking about this in a minute, but we are going to have a speaker from San Diego that was chief of nice. staff to a council member to, to talk about the, that transition and, and outcomes. So thank you for that question, Commissioner Sanchez. Good, and that'll be a very helpful speaker. Yeah, great. Thank you for that mm -hmm. recommendation, Professor Christensen. Uh, Commissioner Tran, any luck? I think I'm back on here. Yes. Woohoo. All right. All right. <laughs> thank you. I, I see the applause. I appreciate it for your support. That was a very challenging time. Um, no 
So, uh, actually, so uh, uh, just a quick, frank observation before we get to my question. But uh, you know, Professor Christensen is the first uh, speaker who's actually expressed even a modicum of support for for uh, um, strong mayor uh, or uh, mayor central system. So, uh, you know, I think that perspective is appreciated so that we can, you know, hear and evaluate all the arguments. Um, to Professor Kern, first of all. The data that you presented was quite helpful, but I'm also curious to see about how uh, what turnout was like for the citywide propositions on the on the uh, years with mayoral elections. Because I'm curious to find out if um, voter turnout was just lower overall, um, or if there was or, or a higher rate of undervoting or I guess drop off, whatever term is used here um, in presidential years. Uh, so, uh, did you have that data available? I don't, Commissioner, but I could get it and send it to you. Yeah, I think it would be helpful just uh, because it would be helpful to see if the picture, um, if there's a high ter voter turnout on the one issue matters, but still a lower vote count on the mayoral race. I think that might be another data point for us to assess here uh, in terms of the scheduling of the elections. Also, um, you know, the, the, in a letter that was sent by uh, Peter Allen, he did give us some data showing that there were under votes. Um, and, uh, you know, my initial reaction to that was that if we have higher turnout overall, I mean, we can't ever 100% get rid of the quote unquote under votes, but, uh, you know, we have a higher general voter turnout because a rising tide lifts all boats, so to speak. Um, the, it, uh, have you, were you able to compare data at all to see what the difference is in terms of undervotes in uh, in um, the mayoral years versus the presidential years, I was, and so I briefly, I, so I read the memo, and um, my understanding was is that he was looking at also at undervote, undervotes in city council elections, and so city council elections are by district, and so I'm comparing um, citywide races, so or Garrick and I are comparing citywide races. So we have the citywide races for those um, citywide measures and for the mayoral races. And we looked at the undervotes. Um, so the ballot roll off in those citywide races, we briefly today looked at 2020. Um, so the citywide race in the presidential year, measure G, and compared that to the mayoral race in 2018 and found it was very, very similar. And then our previous analysis, we compared the presidential races to the mayoral races and found it was like maybe a percentage and a half to 2% difference. And so we haven't compared them to city council races because city council races are district wide, they're not city ride, city wide. So mm -hmm. comparing a city wide election, comparing a mayoral election to district elections, or comparing a city wide measure race to district elections is not what we're doing. We're comparing, you know, what would, what do we expect turnout and now you know, folks are very interested, of course, in ballot roll off. What would it look like in presidential years? So it's more appropriate to compare it to another citywide race, not to a district wide race. Can I just uh, jump so in? Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Professor Christian. Yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to go to your first point. Um, you need to hear from former Mayor Tom McHenry if you want to hear somebody talk about a strong mayor form of government. Mm. Appreciate that. Um, okay, so I think then that the relevant data point here, if we were going to compare undervotes on a citywide basis to a citywide basis, yes, would be to compare um, the votes on the citywide propositions on as well in the same year as uh, where we're voting for mayor, and we can compare the undervotes there to see what the difference is. Too. You could do that, but if you wanted to compare ballot roll off, so ballot roll off in a presidential year in a citywide race to ballot roll off in a mayoral year. Because one of the concerns is if you move the mayor, mayoral election to a presidential year, you're gonna see more ballot roll off. The only comparison really, the only co comparable election would be another citywide race during a presidential year. And those are those measures that we use, Mez measure G for instance in 2020. So in 2020, you could look at a citywide race, which is measure G and look at the ballot roll off and compare that to the 2018 mayoral election. And if you see a huge ballot roll off in that citywide race, you, you might have an argument suggesting you might see really big ballot roll off if you move the mayoral election, but we just don't see evidence of that. But comparing mm -hmm. mayoral ballot roll off to mayor, to city, uh, to district um, uh, city council ballot roll off, you're comparing apples to oranges, not apples to apples. 
Okay. Okay. I mean, Thank you, Commissioner yeah, Tran. I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna move us on. Okay. Um, but if you have additional questions, please, um, when you reach out to me, and I'll I'll make sure that they get answered through um, our our guest speakers. Uh, so I have um, Commissioner Bruce. Did you have a question? No. Okay. So I've got Commissioners uh, Siegel, Meitzke, and Calendar. Commissioner Siegel. Hi. Thank you. This is for uh, both of our speakers. Thank you so much for being here today. Which specific additional powers do you think would be useful for the mayor of a mayor of San Jose to have now, if any? A stronger role in hiring and firing department heads, uh, maybe more direct authority over, over the city manager. Start with those. What would direct authority be? The, the power to fire? The city manager? Uh, it could be the power, uh, power to power to fire. Uh, right now, uh, it just takes a majority on the city council uh, to fire the city manager. Uh, the mayor can propose that at any time and try try to get the vote. So it's not out of the realm of possibility. The other thing would uh, would probably be uh, to expand the budget authority of the mayor. How so? How so specifically? Right now, the mayor provides the broad guidelines uh, with the mayor's budget statement. The council has to uh, agree to support that. Then it goes to the city to the uh, then it goes to the city manager uh, to work out the details. Uh, the mayor's office of budget, the, the mayor's budget analyst, that office could be expanded uh, to play a to play a greater role and go into more detail on how the how the budget is uh, <clears throat> put into effect. Thank you. Great. Um, uh, Professor Kern Percival, anything to add? Oh, I was going to defer to our local politics expert. I have nothing. Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, uh, we have Commissioner uh, Meiske, Calendar, and then Amador. Commissioner Meiske. Uh, yes. Thank you both for your presentations. It actually changed my mind quite a bit from where I was. I have a question for uh, Professor Christensen, actually. You may have already answered it with some of the other um, questions. But uh, um, Right now, what this commission is set up to really look at should the mayor's um, powers be expanded. It's not really set up to say, should they be reduced and push it back more towards the council? Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, um, one, a couple of reasons why we might wanna do that. One, just for due diligence, that you know, we should be looking at all the options available here. But also, if we look at, if we go back to a pure um, mayor manager, council manager form, if I get that right, um, it might help us lead us to why, what kind of um, leadership really is needed in terms of citywide leadership for our community. And I, I heard you talk about what you, in the last uh, speaker, you talked about what you think should be happened, but you didn't say why. Why is that level of leadership needed? So I just, I guess my question really is, um, what do you think of that approach of looking at, hey, let's push it all back to the city manager um, to help us kind of get a feel for this? Or is that just too far out in left field for us to look at? Well, it's in left field, but it's pretty interesting question uh, that actually I think could strengthen uh, your interest in expanding the powers of the mayor uh, to look at, to, to, to look at uh, what it would be like to even further reduce uh, the power and authority of the mayor. If there's no budget role whatsoever, if you take away the, the, uh, the budget and public information officer of the mayor, uh, what happens what then? Happens? Then is it harder to get consensus on the council? I think the answer would be yes, but I think it's I think it's a perfectly valid uh, way to uh, to look to look at the changes that may or may not be may or may not be needed. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah, uh, appreciate that uh, that perspective, uh, Commissioner Calendar. All right. Uh, good evening, um, uh, Professor Percival and Professor Christensen. Definitely was very enlightening to hear from you. Good to see you, Professor Christensen. I haven't seen you in quite uh, some time. Professor Christensen, you, you mentioned something. You said there was two elected city attorneys and you alluded to there may be some concerns or some problems with having directly elected uh, city attorneys. So I, I wanted to hear one. The first part of my question is why did you, why did you believe that's problemat problematic? And then two, I would like you to look into your um, political science crystal ball and tell me what do you believe would happen if we had other department heads that were elected, such as uh, the police chief or even the police auditor? 
Um, okay. So um, what, what, what I hear, what I've heard from Oakland, what I've heard from San Diego, and when you talk to the former chief executive for the, the previous mayor of San Diego, uh, she'll fill you in on uh, what it's like working with the city attorney. That does add, a, 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 an independently elected city attorney adds conflict. Uh, and, and be, by virtue of the fact that that's a citywide elected official, just like the mayor, but not like the district city council members. So it's much more powerful than, uh, than, than the council members because of a, a larger constituency, a, a larger uh, electorate. And I'm not an enthusiast of electing department heads uh, uh, simply because actually running a department it's different from being a mayor and being a political leader. Actually running a department requires some expertise in what the department does. Uh, and elections don't always produce that expertise. It's hard for us as voters uh, to know uh, whether somebody really has the expertise to be a city attorney uh, or a police chief and to understand what their biases might be. Bias is really important in a city attorney because there are city attorneys who will tell the council and the mayor they can do almost anything they want to do and we'll find a way to, to do it legally. And there are other city attorneys who will uh, tell a council, and, an elected council and the mayor, no, you can't do virtually anything because there will be some law against it. Fortunately, we don't have that problem in San Jose, uh, although we have had extremely conservative city attorneys who, who were stood in the way of of council and, and, and mayoral action. So I'm, I'm not an enthusiastic, uh, an enthusiast of elected department heads, I like accountability better through the executive ranks, either to the city manager or to the city or to the mayor. All right, thank you. Thank you. So we have a, a question from Commissioner Amador, and then we're going to wrap up unless there's a question from somebody that we haven't heard from yet tonight. We'd like to make sure that we have a chance to hear from everybody that have questions um, before we go back. Um, otherwise, we'll wrap up and move on. So um, Commissioner Amador, please. Yes, and this is uh, towards the data that was shown. I just want to know more uh, if there is data available that uh, shows a little bit more on the districts, um, because I know that we saw an increase when we put it with a, um, a presidential election. But is that is there some data that tells us, because we know that some districts do carry um, more communities of color and more um, low income communities, renters. Is there data that represents that those districts did also have a higher turnout when it came to that? So a higher turnout um, for the citywide measure by district? Yes. I don't have that, but I can contact the Registrar of Voters um, to see if I can get that. And it may actually be by precinct, but I can definitely look at that. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Amador. Uh, Commissioner Posadas. Hi, good evening. Um, so I, I see our role as commissioners as, as really balancing the interests of both the mayor, the city council, as well as the city manager. So my question is if strengthening the role of the mayor results in the weakening of the role of the city manager, could you foresee the possible unintended consequences of either city administration or individual uh, department head becoming more political as a way to respond better to the stronger mayor than they currently do to the city manager? And would that be a probably good thing or a bad thing? Your thoughts on that? Oh, well, that's certainly a possibility. And you see that in some other cities that have a strong mayor form of government where the department heads themselves are pretty political. Frankly, we've seen that in San Jose under a council manager form of government in the past, not in the last decade or so. Uh, so that's that that happens. It could happen and it could be a shortcoming or and it could not necessarily be a bad thing if they're responding to constituents that the uh, that the mayor's trying to satisfy on services rendered by the departments in question. All right, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Zhao. Um, um, my question is uh, to Professor Percival, and thanks for the analysis. Uh, um, I learned a lot from it. So I just, uh, while I'm listening, I did a very quick check on the election result, uh, results. So um, I compared the district results for the district council election 
and on the same year. So each district turnouts are actually very different. Um, it could be for a various reasons, but the overall, I think uh, the election, uh, the president election year, the overall results could be higher. Um, but my question is, um, in during the presidential election, because the heated uh, um, uh, the election, uh, it results everything, uh, the voter reach out cost to be a lot higher. So if we move the uh, mayoral election to the presidential election, which means the, the election cost will be high because you have to use all means to reach out to the voter. It's not gonna be uh, counting on two legs. So how, how can we um, balance, because I understand that we have to reach out to the underserved uh, uh, communities, those voters, and uh, the people, the candidates have the less financial advantage uh, will, 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 um, will be harder to reach out. So is there any suggestions or is there, um, how do we solve that problem? It's an excellent point, Commissioner. I'm gonna circle back to something that Terry said. Um, absolutely, the media should pay more attention to local races and absolutely during presidential year pay more attention to the mayoral race. Um, lesser known candidates always face a disadvantage in elections and you know that we know in all types of elections. So the mayoral race we will expect is going to be more expensive if moved to the presidential years, but it's probably going to get more attention from the media and will certainly encourage media and all sorts of get out the vote organizations, all sorts of civic organizations like the League of Women Voters to be more actively, to remain actively involved in local elections and especially during the presidential year. So that might help um, subsidize the cost of information for voters. So the recommendation that I would make for candidates is you will have to reach out farther for voters, but you're going to reach a more diverse electorate. And so you're going to be represented or you're going to be elected by a more representative electorate. And therefore, when you serve in office, you can claim that you have a um, that you've been elected by a, a more of San Jose, essentially, that the policy that you recommend, the policy that you help to enact on behalf of the voters really represents more of the people. So I think it's more of a democracy argument. I mean, that's one of the recommendations I would give to the commissioners is that it's really more of a democracy argument. Yes, elections will be more expensive for individual candidates, but the elections themselves will be more representative and more democratic. Great. Right. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask uh, your, your wrap, wrap up thoughts, uh, Frederick well, Richardson. I just want to add to that. Sure. In gubernatorial elections, we should remember that we're not only electing a governor, but seven other statewide officials. So there's an awful lot of campaigning and an awful lot of spending going on in those years. Actually, more campaigning and spending in California than there is in presidential campaigns, because president, presidential candidates don't campaign here, uh, they suck up the media. And that's really important and, that, and our attention is, is drawn to them. But remember in the gubernatorial years, there are, there's an awful lot more going on uh, in actual campaigns. I would just add one other point. Uh, you might wanna think about the size of the council at some point. If you do go to any kind of, if you do move towards a strong mayor system, in almost all of those systems, the mayor no longer sits and votes as a council member. So you would have to add at least one seat uh, to the city council uh, to make it 11 and, 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 and an odd number so you don't have tie votes. You could add a couple more seats. It would enhance representation. The districts would be a little smaller. There are over 100,000 people now. That's getting kind of big. Uh, so number of council districts might be something you want to consider along the way. The redistricting commission will not be considering that. Their specific charter mandate is to redistrict 10 districts only. So that's a completely separate issue from 
uh, premium districting. Uh, and with that, I'll conclude and thank you all for your service. Uh, I will continue uh, watching and listening to what goes on with the commission and I'm happy to answer questions uh, separately from uh, events like this. So thank you all. All right. Thank you, Professor Christensen. Thank you, Professor Professor Kern Percival. Uh, mm -hmm. And I also want to thank uh, Commissioner per Percival, uh, who helped behind the scenes uh, put this data together. And uh, we felt the best to have uh, Professor Kern Percival present. But uh, you know, his his efforts, I I don't want to go um, un unthanked. So. Um, uh, hope to uh, be in touch with you both again. Uh, if there's questions, we'll forward, you, uh, forward them your way. And thank you all for the, for the great questions. I think this was a really helpful session. I'm gonna turn it back to the chair. Thank you, Professor Christensen and Professor Curran. First of all, we really appreciate you being with us tonight. Um, I will now call for comments from the public. And um, first speaker. Robert Brownstein. Good evening again. Uh, unfortunately, I, I uh, have to disagree with my uh, good friend, uh, Dr. Christensen. Uh, I agree that as cities get bigger and more diverse, it's more difficult to craft a representative solution to uh, public policy problems. But I absolutely disagree with the notion that those conflicts disappear if you have a strong mayor who can ignore the challenge of trying to craft a representative solution. Um, what you often get um, when you have that kind of unwillingness to do the work to craft a representative solution is things like you see in San Francisco and Oakland, which is ballot box budgeting, which is the people who can't get listened to by the mayor go to the ballot box and have the voters do the budgeting for the city. And if you want to see incredible messes in terms of um, how public finance is done at a local jurisdiction, um, check that out. Everybody can find an attractive uh, proposal to put on the ballot and pull parts of the budget to be used to fund that because the mayors were unwilling or unable to do the work uh, to come up with consensus solutions. Um, I think the, re the reality is um, mayors with leadership skills, mayors with drive, uh, mayors who will do the work can put these representative solutions together. Um, and perhaps the solution is to make sure that we elect people who have these capacities and we may, may be better able to do that if we change the dates of the election. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brownstein. Next speaker. The next speaker is the caller that be ends with the number 5140. Speaker 40. Thank you. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I, I used to believe that there shouldn't be a city manager because the city manager was a bureaucrat. But given what I've seen with Sam Licardo, I almost want to get rid of the mayor's office altogether. And I don't want to see him have any more power. He has enough power already. I mean, he, he orchestrated uh, the stand down of, uh, of having the police officers arrest anybody during uh, the uh, counter protest during a Trump rally in 2016. He, he orchestrated that. He was forced to apologize because he gave the, the directive to have 20, 250 officers stand down and not arrest people who were assaulting Trump supporters. Now, I don't expect people to love Donald Trump, but imagine what kind of power he had to do that. And where did he get that idea from? Hillary Clinton? I don't know. But I do know that I want to see Sam Ricardo out of politics forever. I'm not, I would never, ever want to have a strong mayor, especially in this town, because it's bad enough already, as much as I hate a city manager government. Thank you. Thank you, next speaker. Blair Beekman. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you for this item today. Uh, it sounds like you're starting to ask a bit more questions about what exactly a strong mayor can be. And, uh, 
it's sad <laughs> for myself, but it's important to to have good opinions uh, on both sides of the issue. And it's my real belief that we're you know headed towards a process. I mean, uh, Mayor Licardo wanted things like the strong mayor to have developmental power, a singular developmental power to to talk with development agencies and the like. I don't think we're going in that direction with the future of a strong mayor. I think a strong mayor is gonna help decide the future of city manager's role and uh, you know those sort of responsibilities. It's a more refined effort that I, I hope we'll be working towards in San Jose. I think the concept of a city manager council is incredibly important. In fact, I would like to call that process a, uh, a city council community process that we're working towards in our future and better developing from 1985 and all the way back, basically. Um, you know, I good luck in, in our efforts uh, in what we can do. I think the um, yeah, it is the it is the uh, it is the community and it is the council that that's that's the focus. It's 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 the ideas of a. Uh, of democratic practices. It's asking for majority votes of, of, of the firing of people and, and those sort of issues. That's the kind of refinement I'm talking about. And it's not the future of how the mayor can have a developmental power uh, with development agencies. <laughs> I mean, power with development, with development agencies. So um, yeah, uh, that's an important thing to recognize how we talk about the future of the mayor process, I think. Um, thank you. I have serious questions about the future of the, this public process that I hope I can bring up at the end of the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Beekman. Next speaker. Omar Torres. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Good evening, commissioners. Thank you for your service to our city. It's always great to hear from Professor Christensen. By the way, he's my college advisor and former teacher at San Jose State University. So hello, Professor Christensen. My name is Omar Torres. I'm Deputy Chief of Staff for Councilmember Magdalena Carrasco, who authored the proposal to move our mayoral election uh, to the presidential cycle. Uh, easy and accessible voting has always been uh, one of many social justice issues of our lifetime. Across the country, we are seeing direct assaults on voting and participation at all levels of, uh, at all levels of government. We have seen that COVID-19 has disgustingly exposed inequities in our most vulnerable communities, including at the ballot box. Councilmember Carrasco hopes that this commission takes the lead in making sure that making sure we have greater participation from our beautiful and diverse San Jose community. San Jose must set the example. We celebrate greater participation. We need equity at the absentee ballot box for our San Jose residents. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Torres, next speaker. Name our strategies. Hey there, sorry, that's the business uh, name. This is Peter Allen, a former planning commissioner. Um, very good to see you all commissioners. Thanks so much for the time tonight, uh, Chair Ferrer. Um, I would absolutely not argue with the fact that turnout, voter turnout on the whole in presidential years is uh, not significantly higher than it is in gubernatorial years. I would, however, with all due respect to our political scientists in the Zoom, take issue with the notion of apples to apples comparisons in their analysis when you're looking at their chart, which compares a 2018 mayoral, fairly well uncontested mayoral election in the June primary to a ballot measure on the November 2020 ballot where we had almost record levels of turnout, at least in recent memory. So I just wanna point out that, you know, numbers can be crafted and, and moved around to make, your, make a point. Um, and I think you should take a look at that. But that being said, I would like to go back to something Dr. Christensen said earlier, which is what is the problem that you were trying, think about the problem you're trying to solve and think about the power of the charter to solve that problem. Um, if you were going to move the mayoral election, I think that's fine if you're also considering empowering the mayor more because then the position does have a little more importance. But in, in absent, absent that, if you move the mayoral election to gubernatorial years, you're basically saying that districts one, three, five, seven, nine, matter less and that the voters, the infrequent voters, the people of color, the, the young voters who are uh, not voting in those elections, you know, they their voices matter somehow less in electing their district representative when in fact a district representative is just another, another vote um, and you need six votes to get anything done in the city. So I would make that 
small point. And then also moving this election to the uh, presidential year or any of the elections to the presidential year would not make it easier to vote. It would not increase access. You would still have the same access to the ballot. So we really have to examine why people are not voting, why there is an undervote, why there is a ballot drop off as has been referenced earlier. If we can address that, I think we'll solve a lot more than just simply moving the election date. Thanks very much. Have a great night. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Next speaker. Jeffrey Buchanan. Uh, members of the commission, uh, Jeffrey Buchanan with Works Partnerships USA. Um, first, I'd like to thank the chair for, for selecting two wonderful speakers for, for today's topic. Certainly, uh, uh, to date, uh, the commission has, has covered a lot of topics, but I appreciated that we finally made time to talk about election timing. Um, as someone who spent a, a, a fair deal of uh, 2020 talking with voters about the, uh, the concept of, of moving our mayoral election, I can tell you that it's broadly popular in the city of San Jose. In fact, uh, public polling suggested 80% of San Jose voters would support moving the election uh, to presidential years. Um, that's that's right up there with uh, with apple pie uh, favorability numbers. So uh, I, I think that the data presented in today's conversation was fairly clear uh, when we're talking about the election of a mayor and ensuring that uh, that mayor is accountable to the entire city of San Jose, uh, trying to have an electorate that's better represented of, of young voters, of renters, of people of color, uh, of non-native voters, of, of individuals who are lower income or uh, who have uh, uh, completed lower levels of education. All of these are, 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 are underrepresented and, and you know, uh, populations that many would say uh, are, are more likely to be underrepresented in, their, in terms of our elected officials. And so uh, certainly appreciate the, the comments by, by Mr. Torres earlier on behalf of uh, Councilmember Carrasco at a time when uh, we're, we're seeing so many uh, uh, attacks and efforts around disenfranchisement. Shouldn't we be trying as a city of San Jose uh, to be uh, strengthening our democracy, having more representation you know, bringing those uh, estimated 148,000 additional voters into the process of selecting our next mayor. Uh, it seems very important. I hope that the commission continues to act on it. Thank you, Mr. Buchanan. Next speaker. Roland. Thank you, Mr. Chase. So what I'd like to do is to follow up on this uh, conversation we had uh, last time about the uh, firing of a former city manager at Chicago. And um, I, I did, um, you know, study it in more detail. And wh what I found out, and I'm sure all, all of you also did, if you all also studied the situation, is that uh, Commissioner Lazard was essentially absolutely correct about how this happened. May, may, well, then um, Mayor-elect Ricardo had lined up sufficient support on council to put forward a resolution that if passed would have resulted in the firing of the city manager. Very simple. And the only reason this never, never went to council it's because at Chicago, knowing that basically, you know, he was going to get booted out, you know, resigned. And that's why it never went to council. So it seems to me unclear as to why we need a, a stronger mayor than what we already have. Since essentially he can, you know, uh, line, line up uh, sufficient uh, council members to basically get the job done. And quite frankly, at the end of the day, that's what democracy is all about. Um, now, the other thing about, um, you know, aligning the mayoral elections with the presidential elections, you know, as I pointed to you last time, is the question in front of you, what's going to happen in the two intervening years? Are you going to be extending Mayor Ricardo's tenure as a mayor for another two years, or are you just going to be electing somebody else for two years? And that's my two cents for tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Roland. Next speaker, please. Cynthia. Oh, sweet. Y'all hear me? All right. Yes. Hi. Um, hello, Charter Review Commission humans. My name is Cynthia in public. I am a local producer, small business owner, comedian, 
and I'm currently broadcasting live with Only in San Jose in, on Twitch. Um, I listened to this entire meeting and there was a lot of back and forth regarding the strong mayor initiative, moving mayoral elections to presidential election years. And I think that we're looking at a lot of these issues backwards. Rather than focusing on some of the logistical issues that come with these changes, I think it's important to certain the decisions, to certain these decisions on the people that it impacts. So based on personal, the data that Percival has presented, I think that it's important to continue to compile that data and focus on um, the really achieving the outcome we desire, which I think we can all agree on is a greater representation of our very diverse population in San Jose and strengthening our democracy. Um, in addition to that, I think we need to place a stronger focus on addressing the potential systemic reasons why people don't vote between presidential elections. It could be related to, hey, they don't get four hours to pay time off, they're not going to vote. Or maybe there's not as many like voting booths or access to a lot of these things that are more accessible during presidential years. Um, I just wanted to make that comment. Um, I'm interested to hearing more. And um, I just want to emphasize that at the end of the day, we're all trying to represent the people of San Jose. So we should be working hard and trying to figure out how the solutions that we come up with can better increase representation during voting, as well as increase representation of our very diverse pool of, of constituents. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Next speaker. Jake Tonko. Hey everyone, my name is Jake Tonkel. I'm a resident of District 6 and former candidate for San Jose City Council. I love the conversation around focusing on voter turnout and wanted to expand what we're looking at, particularly around Peter Allen's you know, clarification of the difference between a primary and a general turnout. Um, there are multi-choice voting systems out there, ranked choice voting, star voting, approval voting, that would allow us to circumvent a primary election. To me, this has a, a big equity improvement. Not only can voter turnout between a primary and a general improve between 50 and 100%. The District 4 race you know, doubled. It was 100% uh, voter turnout increase. The District 6 race was 50% increase. Um, but it also shortens the cycle for candidates, meaning they have to raise less money and take less time off of work away from their families, which can lead to a higher caliber of candidacy or options for candidacy that might more closely represent the community itself and the people that should be qualified and are qualified to do so in representing their community. Um, so I'd like to suggest that we open up some of the you know, TBD research on voter turnout to those types of models. Um, I think we'll see a lot more of empowerment as well as people understand that they have many different choices for candidates and, and not just, uh, you know, the, the lesser is of two evils, which is a common phrase, particularly among disenfranchised um, non-voters, I would say. So I wanted to make that my two cents for tonight. Thank you, Ms. Conkle. Next speaker. Sandy Perry. Hello, um, this is Sandy Perry. Uh, I'm with the Affordable Housing Network of Santa Clara County and also CHAM Deliverance Ministry. We work on housing and homeless issues in the city of San Jose. And uh, we're strongly in favor of moving the mayoral election. Uh, we're in the middle of a huge battle all over the country around the future of democracy or whether we'll even have a democracy uh, after, uh, depending on what happens in the Senate uh, and in all these state legislatures. So uh, I think it's appropriate that we're having this discussion here today. And I think, and I strongly favor the election of the mayor during presidential years. Uh, that certainly the issues that Affordable Housing Network works on, um, uh, such as housing, uh, homelessness, rent control, and uh, these are the issues which uh, impact more than other people, even the people of color, low-income people, youth. These are the people that are most affected by some of the most important decisions that the 
city council makes, and these are all implemented, uh, influenced by the mayor and the role that the mayor plays. So uh, we strongly support um, switching the mayoral election to the presidential years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Next speaker. Alina. <laughs> Hi, um, Alina here. Um, firstly, I would really like to thank uh, Commissioner Matsumura for bringing up on how we speak about voters. And I think if there's anything to be said about whom is less informed and more informed, I think we also need to think about, you know, the amount, I think some commissioners have brought up, there's a lot of coverage of the presidential. So that means there's a lot of material. And also, you know, we need to understand the language barriers and the access um, access to civic process, especially as we're going through this and we've been debating about language uh, translations. Um, demographically, certain communities, especially non-English speakers, you know, have less resources to participate in, in these between elections. And like my co-host Cynthia said, you know, it's about bringing more of the San Jose representation. And for everybody else listening, there's a group of us on twitch.tv slash only an SJ and we're in a chat and we're talking about this. So feel free to join in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Alina. Next speaker, please. Alina was our last speaker. Thank you very much. Um, I will now move us to our old business, which is the update from staff. Tony, I'm going to start with you. The biggest update, oh, let me turn on my camera. Hold on. The biggest update is your letter was heard at the last two rules meetings, the first time it went to the public record, which is the normal process for boards of commissions letters. And then that was moved to the actual rules agenda for discussion last week. And with no discussion, um, it was just moved to council for next week. So there's just nothing to update you on anything they may have said um, regarding your letter. So all of that discussion will occur next week. I want to just uh, thank the fellow commissioners who attended that meeting and spoken in, in favor of our request. Um, I appreciate both the both times folks being there to support us. Um, and it was unanimously passed out of the rules committee um, that I appeared before, so which is good. And now we'll go to the April 27th city council meeting uh, for the discussion and vote as well. Um, city attorney, Mark. Hi there, I have, I have nothing to report um, unless there's any specific questions that anybody has uh, for me. Um, yeah, I don't think there's um, the, I'm not sure that we had anything for, for Mark, but Tony was going to speak to the process for holding public hearings and subcommittee rules. All right, okay, subcommittee rules, sorry. So there's two different types of subcommittees. There's standing subcommittees and then there's ad hoc subcommittees. Um, ad hoc subcommittees, and Mark can correct me if I'm saying any of this wrong, um, you can create a, a subcommittee that doesn't need staff. So if you want to have, you know, three people, it needs to be less than a quorum to look at a particular topic to say, um, we want three people to look at just moving the mayoral election. We want um, three people to look at um, if we move the mayoral election, how do we handle the next mayor term? Is it going to be a two-year term or a six-year term? And they can meet without an agenda. They can meet without me. They can meet without minutes taking. They can just meet on their own and then come back and report to the commission. That would be it that an ad hoc commission subcommittee needs to be limited in term to um, less than six months. You guys are pretty much not going to be much more than six months um, at this point, but uh, ad hoc subcommittee needs to be limited in term. A standing subcommittee, if you were to create one, we're going to have this subcommittee and it's going to go for the entire length of our time. Um, that still requires staff, it requires an agenda, it requires minutes. Um, so we tend to we tend to ask commissions to not do standing subcommittees because a standing subcommittee is just as much work as the committee of a whole. But subcommittee, ad hoc subcommittees can be really useful to have a couple people who maybe are really interested in one portion of your work plan and they really wanna like get together and, and talk it through and come up with some ideas. 
or to be able to, to do extra research and report back. So that, that's one of the options you guys would have if you want to, to do some sort of subcommittees. Again, we don't really want you to do a standing subcommittee because it's just as much work for us versus a ad hoc subcommittee. Um, I see some hands up. Is this a question for the clerk? So Commissioner Matsumura, Commissioner Posadas, Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Zhao, all have your hands up. So Commissioner Matsumura. Thank you. I just wanted to, um, I have a question for the clerk regarding the budget, but it sounds like we should close out the, the subcommittee discussion before coming back to that. All right, thank you. I'll come back, back to you. I see everyone's hands down again, so we're good. Okay, um, so Commissioner Matsumura, you can ask your question about budget. I, I just wanna make sure we also hear from uh, the clerk about public hearings, because we wanted to, to start um, thinking about what a future public hearing would look like and what the commission needs to consider when planning for that hearing, whenever it is. Okay, so for public hearings, we this this itself is like a public hearing. All members of the public can attend, they can speak, they can raise their hand. Um, and the public hearings we do for like salary setting commission is we'll set up a meeting that's just to hear from the public. So we it's we get, maybe give them the materials and we want to hear what you want to say about this topic. And we don't necessarily engage um, in a discussion and action item. So that's one type of public hearing. There's different types. So that's what we do for Salary Sitting Commission. We, or what we used to do when Salary Sitting Commission, um, they only meet every five years now. So they would have a, a public hearing in the north, central, and south part of San Jose. We'd send out invites to through the council offices. And then people would come and we'd have the commission sitting there and people would just say, we think the council's overpaid or underpaid. We think this, and they, they would just talk. Um, there, another type of public hearing is what you see at the council meetings where it would be part of an agenda like tonight. Um, it wouldn't be held at a special time. We would just mark it as a public hearing and it would be the same kind of thing where you're coming and you're, you're getting their input. Um, so if you're interested in, and then there's the other public hearing is that like once you have a recommendation and you're, you're kind of like, we think we want to go with this type of structure with this action date and this adjustments to power. And then you have that sort of all written and packaged together. Then you invite the public to come in where they have something to read, something to look at, something to comment on. If we wanted to do a public hearing now, I would say like, what do you need fixing? But generally our public hearings, you have something in front of them. So I feel like there's there's so many different types of public hearings, I'm confusing everybody. <laughs> well, that's helpful. <laughs> um, Tony, you had mentioned um, a few points in the past um, location that you might do something mm -hmm. around. Is there any requirement? And I guess it's a two part question. Since we're in Zoom right now, do we anticipate continuing to do Zoom public hearings for the foreseeable future? If things should open up, is there a requirement to have public hearings uh, across the city and how should the commission think about planning for that? I, I don't think there's a requirement, but I think it's something we should do. I think yeah. that's best practice Yep. Um, because not everybody has access to technology. Not everybody has access to transportation. So the, the hybrid is good. The moving forward, doing a hybrid meeting where we have, say, um, a community room in District 5, and we're going to have a meeting, and it's going to be partially Zoom and partially in public. That gets tricky because I don't know how the, the technology is in the other community rooms. Like, I know we can do that at City Hall because we have a big screen to put this, this, like this screen on a big screen. I don't know how, how that would work at the community centers. That's something that we're, we're working on. We've kind of got a, a task force um, looking at the return to work with, with hybrids. Um, at least for now, up through probably the end of June, we're looking at 100% Zoom. So it would be, you know, one Zoom. We could target council districts if you want to say, we, wanna tar we want you to target like this geographical area. I can work with the city manager's office with their next door account to target zip codes. 
Um, and then I can, of course, work with the council office. And then we also have the list of neighborhood commissions per district, or not neighborhood commissions, neighborhood organizations per district that we can target. Where if like, we really are looking for this. Um, I'd hopefully in like mid July, we could go in person because um, we are going to go dark with you guys for the first two weeks of July. Um, but that, that's kind of what we're looking at. It's still, you know, balls in the air as we talk about it with, because it's, it's not just me, it's, it's a multi-department function, the running of meetings. When, sure. and when it's Zoom, it's pretty much like me and IT. <laughs> and um, just last question, um, as far as timing of announcing a public meeting and the preparation, what kind of a window would you uh, expect to, to need for a, a Zoom meeting um, or and or an in-person meeting? We, I usually go with a 10 day notice out. Um, no, is it 10 day? Yeah, 10 day. Um, Cause it's a pretty standard public hearing notice time. Um, you can also do 30 days. Um, 30 days requires us to really know well, well ahead that you guys are going to be ready. So if you say, we think by July 15th, we're going to have something substantial for the public to come and look at, we can notice it out 30 days. Um, but we generally want to do 10 days out because if I, if I, you say you tell me tonight, we want to have a public hearing, you know, in two weeks tonight, I've got to create the public hearing, I've got to get it out there. It's really ends up only being a week to a week and a half that people can see they can't plan for it ahead of time. So we try to have everything ready for 10 days. So like, like if you direct me two meetings out, we can make sure we've got everything written properly and, and, and can plan the outreach. Okay, let's um, let's move forward because I want to get to the changes that we've made in the work plan as well, so that this will come up again in terms of, thank you, Tony, because that'll help us to make some decisions around calendar. And uh, we have a proposal tonight around what this might look like, especially given the calendar, the way it's kind of moving forward. Uh, but first I'd like um, Lawrence to walk through the governance um, uh, summary document that he that he's uh, adapted and I'm gonna ask for- Did you wanna go back to Commissioner Matsumura's budget question first? Yeah, no problem. I just saw your hand. Commissioner Matsumura about the budget, sorry. Yeah, no, thank you so much. Um, so regarding the funding request that's going to city council on April 27th, I would imagine that city council would be looking for some some guidance or analysis either from staff or the commission about specific numbers or or um, how the funding is going to be allocated. Obviously, we've provided some analysis and discussion on that, but I wanted to find out uh, from the the staff and chair, if possible, uh, what if any plan is there to to provide this kind of information to city council. Um, the budget office is working on a memo with me. So um, the budget office itself is is doing all of that background stuff that you're you're talking about. Um, they're getting the numbers from me. They're um, formulating all of that. I think the other thing is that the office has to look for where these dollars would come from, right? Because it's an unallocated uh, budget item. So that's what they're doing, and they said they'd be ready to come back on April 27th, uh, but thank you to everybody who submitted materials and ideas and costs um, along with the clerk's numbers. I think that'll be, it's helpful for them because they have a working kind of document around what this would look like. Okay, now thank you. you're welcome. Let's move to now, um, Lawrence, would you talk to us about um, the document up updates that you did? Absolutely, uh, let's see, let me get my notes here, okay. so. I would like to walk you through a couple things that uh, I put together. Um, and this is my notes, excuse me. Okay, so uh, the first was the governance summary, governance structure summary of powers and practice document that was sent out end of last week. This was a request um, from commissioners as of the last meeting on April 5th to organize some of the uh, presentation around relevant sections of San Jose's city charter into a document by uh, role. So uh, this is the, the table of contents here, uh, council, mayor, city manager, and I tried to break it up in some basic um, 
um, subcategories. Uh, basically, how each of these roles is, is elected um, or, or removed, and then um, the power or authority they have over appointments, policy, budget, and implementation. And um, also as an updated um, uh, cheat sheet or, or the chart that we've been um, uh, updating uh, as a living document. Thank you all for, for sending along um, thoughts. Uh, I've tried to include this the best I could. And then you'll see that um, there's specific uh, sections called out with the actual verbiage from, from the charter. So this is a, a living document. You'll also notice, excuse me, that under each section, there is an in practice um, bullet that is waiting. Uh, and I, I wanna thank Commissioner Lazat for spending some time sending me a redlined version of this document that includes some uh, initial thoughts about how this plays out in practice. I think we heard some other things uh, from uh, Professor Christensen tonight um, with regards to some of the, the powers that um, mayors have, have taken rather than are being, that have been granted uh, directly in the charter. So uh, there will be a revision to this document in the follow-up, hopefully in the follow-up email. Um, I'll get this to you as soon as you can, but hopefully this is a good, um, another piece of, of, of collateral and, and reference for you to, to guide your, uh, your thinking. If you have other suggestions or recommendations or, or edits, please send them my way. Really appreciate uh, your input and help making this as, as useful as possible to you all. Um, so that is that document. Um, next is the work plan revision. I have not sent this out because I wanted to review it with you all tonight and get your, um, your thoughts. Um, what I have done um, basically is added a new section about subcommittees and recommendations process. So we started to hear last week about the uh, thought of, uh, started to talk a little bit about how recommendations are, are brought to the commission, um, how subcommittees, subcommittees might be involved. So the chair and I have started to think a little bit about what this could look like. And our, our general um, proposal to you all and the approach that we're recommending is, is this. Um, first of all, we wanna make sure that the, the precious time that this committee, this commission has in their, their full meetings is, is used as, as well as possible. And so we wanna leverage the subcommittee um, structure, uh, probably the ad hoc version of subcommittees as, as the city clerk mentioned, to help basically develop recommendations for consideration uh, for the full council. We've heard a lot of different ideas. We've heard uh, input from the public. We'll hear more input from the public but really want to, to create subcommittees that can help to um, build these ideas out and before they're brought and even vet them to make sure that they actually can happen before they're brought to the, to the full commission. The subcommittees that we're proposing are, are basically mirror the, the three different buckets that we've been talking about of governance structure, timing of elections and accountability representation and inclusion. So the thinking here is that we would have one subcommittee for each of these. Um, we would ask commissioners uh, which subcommittee that they're interested in um, uh, commit, uh, joining, if any. It's not a requirement, uh, but if there's a particular issue that excites you um, and you're interested in doing some more research or having conversations with other commissioners, then we would welcome your, your um, continued involvement to um, start to, to really pick up the pace about how we're starting to, to think about these issues and bring um, more fully fleshed out ideas back to the commission for consideration. Um, these these subcommittees would need to be uh, less than quorum and um, we would probably although we don't need staff uh, uh, to be present uh, the chair and I have spoken about at the very least supporting subcommittees um, either by the the chair vice chair or, or myself uh, or, or uh, potentially Marielle my, my colleague who's taking notes on these calls to be there just to help to um, build capacity for facilitation uh, and make sure the conversation is productive and fruitful and, and at least to get things started. But we'll see how that goes. Um, the subcommittees, um, basically, I, there, there's been something that's caught, been brought up a few times about um, sort of what are you looking to change? And so I put together here a, a recommendations process, uh, basically a, a process to bring proposals for recommendations that have been really thought through more than just a, a potential idea. So uh, one of the ideas that came up tonight would be the ability for the, um, the, the mayor to fire the city manager himself or herself. And um, that's a great idea in and of itself or not, but we won't know until we really think through what the implications of that idea are. So what we're proposing here is 
basically a, um, a set of criteria for commissioners um, or the general public should they want to submit a memo that would help uh, expedite the, the consideration of recommendations. Um, but for a particular idea, we're proposing that the commission uh, or subcommittees consider the following. Um, really outlining what problem you're trying to address um, and then getting to what change you are proposing. So make sure that we're clear, clearly defining the problem that we want to address um, and then getting to the change uh, or the revision that we're proposing, proposing to the city charter. Um, thinking through, is that change feasible? Um, we've heard some proposals that really just actually wouldn't work in practice. Um, the idea of, of electing a city manager, I think we heard that um, um, while potentially legally, well, actually, no, it's, it's not legally feasible because uh, I, I heard from some other work that I'm doing that the international, um, oh gosh, uh, city manager association, ICMA, prevents um, <laughs> city managers from, from any kind of political office. So being elected would, would be uh, going against that profession. So really, before we bring a, a proposal to this commission, we want to think through, is it actually even feasible? Um, and at the same time, we also want to be thinking about what the e equity implications are and to have some thoughts about the GARE uh, racial equity toolkit um, uh, to bring to bear on that. And then finally, is this actually, does this need to be a charter revision? Uh, we've heard that there are some practical um, governance um, process that, that happens. And there, there's some things that are basically codified in the city charter. Um, and then there's also powers that, that exist that council uh, or city manager or the mayor may not be using. So uh, we've also heard that the, the city charter is a, a precious document that uh, makes things very rigid. And so we want to be thinking thoughtfully about whether or not something absolutely needs to be a, a revision to the city charter. Uh, and then finally, are there other examples of this change? To pull that all together, uh, I put together a template, which includes basically is a, is a way for us to start. It's a, it's a memo type um, approach, put together proposed recommendations that can be shared with the commission ahead of time using that structure, that communications uh, timeline that we talked about. Uh, Ideally, if there's a if there's a, a proposal that that uh, a subcommittee or 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 an individual commissioner would like the commission to consider, that this uh, um, template is completed and shared with council uh, commissioners before on the Friday before the next meeting, so there's a chance to 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 digest and think through these and have a, an informed conversation. But this template uh, includes uh, simple details like name uh, submitted by and date, and then. Uh, those questions with a couple prompts. Um, what problems are you trying to address? What change are you proposing to, to address or solve that problem? Is this change feasible? What are the equity impl impl implications? Uh, I have a link to the GARE Racial Equity Toolkit with two questions that I pulled out from there. Um, you'll see that some of the questions in other parts, some of the other numbered questions are also uh, <coughs> in the racial equity toolkit so didn't need to duplicate them but i think i thought the questions that who benefits uh from or will be burdened by your proposal and what are your strategies for advancing racial equity or mitigating unintended consequences would be helpful to at least start to consider when we're bringing proposals um uh proposed recommendations to the to the account, uh, commission and then really thinking through, must this be a charter revision? And again, are there other examples of this change um, from other communities? This is not intended to be restrictive or exhaustive, um, but it is intended to be a way to structure our thinking and start to standardize the ways in which we are bringing proposals to the group. Um, and also to best leverage, again, the subcommittee idea um, so that uh, I think we all recognize our time here is limited so that we can really move things along at a, at a faster clip. Uh, this is a draft. would really appreciate um, any thoughts you have or recommendations about revising this. Um, but that will uh, be shared in our follow-up email that will go out on Wednesday. The last thing I wanted to just kind of walk through was a quick update on the work plan. Um, we are on May 3rd and we had, uh, excuse me, we're on April 19th and we had um, our, our professors, guest speakers. On May 3rd, I have booked um, Stephanie Jane and Sabrina Para Garcia from the San Jose Office of Racial Equity. They'll be giving us uh, an overview of, of their work at the office, how the office thinks about racial equity in San Jose and what they're working on. Um, and they have asked commissioners if they have any specific questions. I've done 
excuse me, I've done my best to, to relay some of the topics that we have outlined for, for May 3rd around power and accountability um, in the variance roles um, and analysis of, of influence for accountability, equity, and inclusion. Um, but uh, I do, um, uh, if you have specific questions that you'd like to hear from them, would appreciate you uh, emailing me uh, so that I can inform them so they can be best prepared as possible. I'm also, um, thanks to Commissioner Matsumura in conversation with one of the commissioners on the Detroit Charter Commission. I'll be talking to him tomorrow, um, whether or not he is able to join us on May 3rd or someone else um, that he recommends might be a, uh, the best fit. Uh, hopefully I can get someone else um, slotted in on May 3rd as well. So that um, we can start that um, examples from comparative cities um, uh, across the country. And then on uh, May 17th, I have um, that um, examples from comparative cities across the country continued. And I've uh, booked uh, guest speaker, Amy Fawcett, who as mentioned was chief of staff um, for former San Diego mayor, Kevin Falconer, and was there during the, sh the shift from uh, council manager to mayor council. Um, and uh, apparently is a, a great speaker and is excited to, to be able to share more with, with you all about uh, the mayor council form from her perspective on the inside. On May 17th, um, we'll also start to look at some of the existing proposals that have been put together. We do have a, a research project for our new intern that is to compile all of the proposals from last summer, um, the mayor council memos, um, um, and uh, start to identify additional measures for consideration um, for the discussion sessions in phase two. Um, so we, we're trying to basically seed the subcommittees um, at this point um, with um, a starting point for ideas to consider, both ideas that have, that have been proposed by mayor and council last summer, um, things that we've heard. And I, I mentioned that I've been um, tracking that list and, and um, I will share that list um, once we have as part of that, um, that uh, research project um, to compile the proposals from the have we heard from mayor and council, um, but uh, on May 17th, our thought is that we're able to finish the study session phase and move into the subcommittee phase. Uh, so, um, with the help of um, the chair and and vice chair, um, we would, based on on your input, uh, form the subcommittee rosters and start to schedule those sometime in in mid May moving forward. Um, we also do have a public hearing scheduled. Um, um, basically public comment on the study session topics that we've had to date, potentially some uh, distillation of the, of the governance summary chart, which I think is starting to be distilled into something that could be more <laughs> um, palatable or, or understandable by the general public. Um, and uh, especially if there's uh, certainly more, more budget to, to work with community organizations to, to, to help frame that messaging uh, and, and the questions, that would be really helpful, but we still have not booked a date for that public hearing. So uh, I will stop there. Um, that was a lot. Um, we wanted to spend some time before we wrap up today, basically asking for your feedback um, about this approach to um, recommendations and subcommittees, and also to hear from you uh, if you have an interest in any particular uh, topic to, to join a subcommittee or, or any particular issues that you would, uh, would like to um, basically uh, raise your hand and, and, and sign up for, for some, some deeper work on pulling together recommendations and, and doing having some of the discussions and research uh, to bring them to the, to the full commission. So I'm gonna add just two things. Yeah, please. We have the three uh, bucketed areas, governance structure, timing of elections, accountability, representation, and inclusion. There may be multiple subcommittees in each of these areas because of the fact that you all are looking at different issues or different ideas. So. It's not that we are only going to have nine people doing this. There could be lots of different subcommittees looking at different issues. We have to organize it and coordinate it. Um, tonight, and the second thing is tonight, I'd like to ask for a round robin so that all commissioners have some time to talk about what you, kind of what your interests are and where you could see yourself, if you see yourself in any place at this point, but really ask everyone to contribute um, their, their individual thoughts. Um, Commissioner Marshman and Commissioner Segal. Uh, Chair, do you want to do that now before we take questions, or how do you want to take questions along with the, the round robin? Do you want to? Are these questions about the process or thoughts that you have about as we move forward? 
Okay, yeah, let's, let's just uh, clarify to take questions on, on this proposed process right now. Let's try yeah. and keep them short and sweet so that we can get to that rad robin, uh, understanding we only got 45 minutes left before nine. We'll go over we need to, but um, Commissioner Siegel and then Commissioner right. Marley. So I'm wondering if there is a, uh, a date in which we should be discussing the other portion of what we're charged with, which is um, anything other than this. There have been a lot of other topics that have come up and um, meaning other topics that this commission should potentially address. And at which point um, should we be making motions to address those things? Uh, is there a cutoff date? I'm concerned we're never gonna get to the other branch of what we've been charged with. Well, I, you know, we're trying to, I, I think that we've tried to encapsulate what you've been charged with, which is, is these five, um, um, five items here. The first of which we've, we've put together under governance structure since the first deals with mayor council and the second is mayoral executive authority. Right. The, the second, the second is, is the timing. And then the third is additional measures and potential charter amendments as needed that will improve accountability, representation, and inclusion. So that's why we have, have bucketed this third right. group of subcommittees as that. And I, you know, I, I, as a facilitator do, and, and, and hearing, you know, some feedback from um, folks about scope creep, um, do want to make sure that we stay focused on those five specific recommendations, understanding that this is probably the most broad and the most vague right now. Um, but my hope, and I, I, I'm curious if, if you agree, because it, it seems pretty clear to me and what was laid out by the resolution creating this commission, but that this bucket is, is where the, is the, the other considerations. Um, but I think it's important that we keep other considerations constrained to what was laid out in that resolution. Is, is that aligning with what you're talking about or do you have other thoughts? The, um, many of the commissioners as well as members of the public wanted us to look at policing in the city. So at which point will you be bringing people to discuss that issue or at which point will we be discussing the issue and making proposals around changes to police? Well, I think, uh, I mean, um, for me, policing would probably fall into this, this bucket. Uh, I mean, accountability as far as policing seems like it's probably the, uh, how to categorize that. Um, uh, you know, I, we, we only have so much time to, to bring speakers and, and not to say that we're not going to have more, we can't have more speakers in the study session. Um, but I, I, um, I, my, my sense is that after we finish the topics that we've identified and been talking about in the study session, that it's time to, to start thinking about what the potential recommendations are are and, and bringing them. And then right. there, there's gonna need to be more, more research done both in subcommittee and by the, the full commission. And so that could be a, a moment to, to bring more can, uh, can bring ask, additional speaker in, but. Can yeah. I ask uh, when we have the speaker from San Diego, could he potentially discuss their changes? I understand they've made some pretty sweeping changes. Yeah, if she, if she feels comfortable speaking to that, I'll, I'll definitely, I'll be talking to her. Um, next week or two weeks from now to, to prepare for that. So I, I'd be happy to ask um, her uh, if she can speak to that. And likewise, we're, we're trying to, to find somebody to speak um, on the conversation in, in Detroit. Um, and so th this is where we're getting into the, um, you know, the, the hopefully a practical conversation about what's happened in other communities. But in, in some, I, I, that this is the other bucket. Yeah, I want to move us on. Yeah. If the commissioner has an interest in a specific area, that's what the round robin's for. So Commissioner Sagal, if you said, hey, I really want to look at policing, that would be the thing that you would say in the round robin. We're trying to get a sense of the full commission in terms of where your interests are. So as we look at subcommittees and looking at that, there's, there's, no, there's, no, um, there's no need for us to um, limit any of the discussion or any of the other speakers if we need to. We can certainly do additional pieces. Uh, but I do want to move us to what are the interests folks have. And so I'm going to move to the round robin. I'm going to ask the clerk to call the roll. So we're going to move alphabetically. If you could really just focus in on what are the areas that you'd like to work on or that you think are the most important ones that we need to um, 
uh, that we need to focus on. And as we move through this, there's going to be a lot of repetition. So you can say yes to da 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 da, and then just move. Is there anything in addition so that we aren't um, having to repeat everything all all night? So I'm going to ask the clerk to go through the roll. We'll go alphabetically. Okay, I'll go alphabetically uh, for first name. So we'll start off with Barbara Marshman. Okay, um, I, I have an interest in in government governance and accountability um, and inclusion, and I think they're so closely related. I'm I'm not sure how you separate them. I have a a quick question suggestion for speeding things up. I wonder if there are many of us, if any, who feel we should not recommend moving the mayoral election to a presidential year. It just seems to be such a, a broad issue. And if, if we could get an early determination on that, it would be something we could set aside. If there's a lot of contention about it on the commission, yeah, I think I don't. I, I appreciate that, Commissioner Marshman. We're not there yet. I, you know, I this okay. is we're trying to be very thoughtful about the process by which we right. have a debate or, or constructive conversation about particular priorities. So I don't think that this commission is prepared and has done enough research to really even do a straw poll about about anything. I, I okay. believe me, I would love an early win <laughs> on this, um, but uh, you know, there's a lot to unpack for all these issues. So, but thank you for the suggestion. Okay, that's all. I'll Christina Johnson. Um, I would be interested in doing um, inclusion and also timing of elections. So those would be my first two. Yeah, Elizabeth Monley. Uh, I would be very interested in pursuing um, issues of um, unintended consequences of any actions that we recommend, uh, whether they are to, in order to protect the charter, in order to protect the offices. Um, and I don't know where that falls, but I, th I think it's a broad topic that really can be um, looked into. Thank you. Mr. Monley, that's exactly what I'm saying is, if there's an area that folks think that this is what they'd like to focus on, that's great. Um, and that's a great, it's a great idea in terms of like, that's a very good focus that we might look at in all of them, right? That could be the area that, right. you, that you help us with. So that's great. Appreciate mm -hmm. it. Yes, uh, next. Next is Ellie Matsumura. Thank you. So. Uh, I'm interested in all the areas, but I'm not sure that we have the right committee structure yet. Of, you know, of course, we are just um, receiving and processing this information right now. Um, you know, I think my thoughts perhaps relate to what Commissioner Siegel was saying. Um, the memo we passed in January said that we would conclude our study phase by defining the scope of what we mean by additional measures to prevent that scope creep and that that would happen after having a public hearing. Um, I appreciate that we could have sub subcommittees, but we would be sending additional measures out to a committee with, with no staff and with only a list of, of possible issues, each of which could take an entire commission of its own, police accountability, housing, campaign finance, increasing the number of districts, ranked choice voting, those are just some of the issues that we've heard so far. Um, and so I, I continue to think in accordance with the memo that we passed in January, that we need to have studies of what we mean by additional measures. We need to have ample public input beyond what we've had to this point. And we need to define that as a commission and then set ourselves up for success to really work on those, including making sure that the subcommittees are staffed and we have more resources so that we can give the quality of study to highly complex issues like that, that we've begun to give to, um, to issues like council manager versus mayor council form. Thank you. Up next is Enrico Callender. Yes, uh, um, I, I definitely agree with um, Commissioner Matsumura. Um, I'm not sure that we have quite the right structure, but I, I wish I had a suggestion for a solution. So I think we kind of move into where we are. And the reason why I suggest that 
is I also agree with C uh, Commissioner Segal when she said, what about policing issues? I think we heard some very strong voices about the need to look at policing issues. So I have to say that I am a strong proponent of looking at the other. So maybe that's the accountability, the representation and inclusion a committee. Obviously I have uh, interest in the governance structure and timing of elections. I think there's gonna be enough folks to talk about that, but I do want to represent the often not heard voices. And so I'm going to say, I'm gonna be looking at the other. Uh, so the portion five of which the council wanted us to look at. Up next is Frank Kamitsky. Uh, yes, my thoughts, my, I would like to get involved in the governance structure and the accountability piece of the third bullet. I also think as part of a sub bullet of the first one, we really have to get into what are the leadership needs or concerns in the community that require you know, the mayor to have a certain amount of power. So I think we need to start looking at, you know, what are the issues, you know, regarding citywide leadership. Thanks. Next is Garrick Percival. Uh, thank you. Um, I am happy to continue working on the timing of elections issue. Um, and I and I will just kind of just piggyback on what was said earlier that um, you know, the last piece, the accountability, representation, and inclusion. There's there's so much overlap between that and the other two. I think you know I think we could continue to talk about this, but you know just for example, on timing of elections, of course, as we heard tonight has big implications for things like political representation, accountability, uh, even policing would fall into that category, but also in governance structure, um, in terms of the ability of the, the mayor to, you know, hold a, a police chief more or less accountable, you know, those kinds of things. So I think we, we might, you know, I think we want to find a way that people who are serving on, commissioners serving on these different ones are able to communicate um, across the different a subcommittee structure. So I think that'll be important. We don't have to work that out tonight, but something to think about. We're just getting kind of your, our earliest struggle. Um, fully, we could have had 10 little parts here and we would have been, still wouldn't have been enough. So we're just trying to get folks to start thinking about what would be important. Again, if there's some area that you think we haven't covered yet, but that's the area that you really believe should be part of this, feel free to speak up. We'll, we'll reorganize and um, get the structure right, um, but just wanted to get everyone's kind of voice tonight. Thanks. Next, we have George Sanchez. I think I would like to be, uh, well, I'd like to be involved in all three, but uh, uh, probably would look at uh, governance structure uh, and, and also along with that equity, inclusion, so on, that I think would be, uh, uh, would be parts of that. And, and, and I think probably some others that will come up as we discuss uh, that particular area, but that's what I'm looking at in terms of my, uh, my involvement. Lee Tran. Uh, I'm interested in governance structure. Uh, and if I were interested in, for example, like rank choice voting uh, and policing, would that also be the other category? Then yeah, those two. Next we have Jeremy Barus. Yeah, I'd like to echo some of the sentiment shared by uh, commissioners Matsumura and, and Calendar around uh, govern around the structures of uh, subcommittee structures, but uh, also just in the sake of time, governance structure and um, something around you know representation and inclusion. Jose Posadas is next. Yes, I would um, be most interested in the uh, third item, the uh, accountability, representation, inclusion. Okay. Lund, yep. Uh, I, I'd be interested in, in governance structure. I, I have a question. Does the question of um, assuming the presidential, sorry, the mayor election gets moved to presidential years, the question of two years or six years for the for the next mayor, um, is that also under time a timing, or is that a sub or a separate? Thing? I think it depends on um, you know the um, the the lift for these subcommittees. I um, I, I do want to be clear that. Um, the notion here is that these subcommittees are are putting um, putting some some thought behind these ideas and bringing back to the commission. So you will all see these ideas. Um, 
if there, and I also think that there's a possibility for all of you to recommend ideas to be considered for these subcommittees. Uh, I think what we're trying to do is get an understanding of, of what you're interested in that generally fits within these three categories to understand what the list of, uh, of, of these potential topics for the subcommittees are so that we can start the work. So if in timing of elections, you know, we doesn't seem like there'd be that much many proposals or recommendations to consider, um, you know, it, it may, we may not need a, a second subcommittee on, on this topic, but I would definitely put that issue um, in that bucket and, and we'll see what comes up. This is gonna be a very dynamic process. So thank you for your patience as we work this out. All right, those two then, thanks. Go, great. Linda Lazat is next. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would be interested in the governance structure and I already have some ideas that I'll probably put in the memo with regard to um, increased uh, powers for the mayor. Also the timing of elections I'd be interested in. I wanna thank you, uh, Lawrence, for this uh, outline and the, the, uh, the five criteria that you listed, one of which is, does it really require a charter change? Because I, I, a lot of the, the, of the other issues that people are speaking about, I think that was the admonition that Dr. Christensen said is, do we really want it in the charter or do we want it in a council policy or somewhere else? Because once you put it in the charter, it's, it's hard to get in, it's hard to get out. Whereas uh, we have a council policy manual uh, that may be more appropriate for some of the other issues that we want to address. So I think that answering that question does it really require a, a charter change is gonna be really important for each one of these uh, three committees or sub subcommittees. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Luis Barosio. Perfect, thank you. Thank you for your uh, giving me the time. Um, I'm thinking, uh, I have a clarifying question. For these three subcommittees, will they be happening at the same time? Because I'm kind of wondering if, um, like myself, I'm interested in all three um, at this time. Will they be, uh, were there, would there be opportunities for commissioners to go to all three uh, different cycles of subcommittees? Um, the only challenge we have, I don't assume that they're gonna meet at the same time, but the challenge we have is around Browning. So we can't have um, a, a quorum at any one of these. So we're gonna have to be careful that everybody can't go to everything. Otherwise we're operating as a committee of the whole once we establish quorum. So um, I doubt they're gonna be um, simultaneous meetings, but we'll certainly have to make sure that we can stay in compliance with Brown Act. But aside from that, commissioners could serve on different subcommittees as long as we are in compliance. And that includes a uh, quorum on communications, Brown Act on communications. So for all these, we'll, all these subcommittees will likely be scheduling on their own, but to be a part of that scheduling, we would need to have the, the list of communication below quorum. So you can see how it adds up. But as far as you want to go, as much time as you want to spend, you know, we, we don't want to stop you. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, yeah uh, uh, for me, um, I, have, I have a lot of interest in all of them, um, both, both what's on, on the work plan and also a number five. Um, so I one, two, three at the moment, I know you'll probably need a little bit more, more clarity. Um, and, and I think uh, the next time it's asked, uh, I'll have that clarity. Um, but to follow up on what uh, Commissioner Lazat just brought up in terms of the six um, uh, uh, like filters or questions to ask ourselves, um, I'm kind of wondering if there's any known um, uh, considerations, for example, number six, right? Must it be in a commission review? I'm kind of thinking if I have an idea and I get to number five, yeah, like number five, um, I'm already thinking that, yes, it needs to be a charter um, uh, amendment or a consideration, but is something more meant by that? Is there some examples that could be given uh, for us um, as we formulate our ideas that we can kind of run it by those filters? Thank you, and I, this is the first pass at creating those filters. So if there are specific prompts, you know, I, I can, I, I do intend on in this document to, to create some examples. So we can have a list of running examples if that'd be helpful. Um, I, I think specifically with this one, um, uh, it, it's a question of, of philosophy for, for 
commissioners about whether or not they want to enshrine something in the charter or find another way to implement um, a potential solution to a problem that's been identified. I, I will say that um, in the final report, there will be a list of, of proposed charter revisions that you all agree to and or a minority report <laughs> that some of you disagree to, agree to disagree to. Um, but um, the doesn't mean the report can't include other suggestions from you all. So I think starting to think about what really ends up as a charter revision recommendation versus what's another recommendation that you say to, to Commissioner Lozat's point, this should be, uh, this is more likely better addressed in council procedures manual. So um, we'll, like everything we're doing, you know, we'll, we'll get, add more clarity and, and fidelity to this over time, um, but appreciate other thoughts. And I, I see um, uh, attorney Vanny has a hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on that. Uh, you know, echoing what Lawrence said, some of it is philosophy. If there are any questions about, does this need to be in the charter? Does this not need to be in the charter? You know, you can reach out to me as well. There are certain things, for example, the timing of the elections where the charter does speak about what is required. And so if you're going to change anything, then it will require a charter amendment for that purpose. But generally speaking, yes, what is in the charter and what is not in the charter is, is can be considered a philosoph philosophical um, uh, uh, determination. But uh, feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about that determination. Okay, no, perfect, thank you. I think um, in these last couple of sessions, we've had a lot of uh, expert, um, uh, like folks who have done this before. Um, so for me, I didn't know that there was a procedural uh, like manual, but obviously if you're a former city council member, like you have that um, uh, understanding. And for example, the, the professor Christensen Right, Professor Christensen said, well, you can always think about staff and structure. So, um, and then Mayor Ron Gonzalez said, um, some things to consider would also include um, like leadership ability. And so like, there's just a lot of different things um, and filters, if you will. I don't know like what's a better word. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot of considerations yeah. that I think uh, like Lawrence in that other template, if you can sort of kind of list out some things that could kind of jog our memory and sort of um, compare or do that litmus test against sure. uh, like some of yeah. the- Yeah, well, I, absolutely. I think it's a great idea. I also think that the by the, the very nature of writing something down, um, it, it, it basically makes you ask questions and then it puts it in a format that someone else can review. So the whole beauty of this process is that more eyes are better than one set of eyes and more brains are better than, than one. So um, there's gonna be a lot of uncertainty and unknowns. And so I would, I would definitely caution anybody when using this template um, to, to make sure that the, um, the perfect is not the enemy of the good, meaning just start and share it and have a conversation because someone's gonna know more than you do and, and you're gonna know more than someone else does about something specific. So this is a group process. We're really crowdsourcing ideas and using the best knowledge of everyone together and the community to, to vet these ideas. So um, I, I think it's a, it's a both and Commissioner Barosio. I'll, I'll strive to add what I can as far as additional prompts and, and resources. Uh, and I think um, uh, creating a list of, of other um, levers or, or mechanisms for accountability, you know, uh, uh, enforcement is, is a great idea. Um, but it's also part of this whole idea of a template is to structure proposals in a way that we, they can be easily shared and, and considered and improved uh, by, by your colleagues. Okay, so, that's perfect. Thank you for saying that because one of, one of the things that uh, should be avoided, as you said, um, trying to get it down right the first time may not allow us to really flush it out, right? Yep. So thank you, uh, I really appreciate that. Yeah, you bet. Up next is Magnolia Siegel. Thank you, I'm interested in both governing structures as well as the other category, the accountability and representation and inclusion. However, if you end up having a quorum in the governance structures that causes a problem, I'm happy to drop out of that. Perfect, thank, thank you. you. Maria Fuentes is next. Thank you. Um, I'm interested in the government structure and, um, and 
and within that, the question of the strong mayor. And then I'm also interested in the other one, the third category, but um, um, I think that probably those areas will be covered in everything. So I'll just stick to one, the government structure and the, the, um, the role of the mayor. And then I also wanted to comment, um, first of all, this is excellent. It's a great framework for us to do our work. And of course, you know, we can always, you know, improve it as we, as we start using it. But I want to mention that we need more discussion about the, um, the community outreach and the, well, not, well, the community outreach, but also the, um, public hearings, uh, and I hope we can agendize that for the for a future meeting, because um, primarily um, I want to get something started in that area so that we start hearing more from from a broader community. Thank you. And Commissioner Quintus, I'm not, um, I'm just about, I've been waiting for the council's actions because that's going to determine a lot of what we do. So um, April 27th, we should have a much better idea of what resources we have, which then um, definitely affects our plan, but it hasn't left our, our mindset around uh, making sure we have community engagement. And I thought tonight's engagement was increased and it was great to hear um, some really thoughtful um, comments from the public, which was awesome. Um, thank you for your th for your comments. So Commissioner Brent is definitely in our, uh, under our consideration. Thank you. Next commissioner. Next is Sammy Robledo. Thank you. I would uh, definitely be interested in the timing of elections and the governance structure. And that's a very uh, interesting to me. Can you repeat that last? Uh, I missed that, Commissioner Robledo. Uh, I'm able to get into it. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Sherry Segura. Um, I am most interested in the accountability, um, representation, and inclusion. Um, so definitely that's my first choice. But like Magnolia, I'm also interested in governance structure, but it sounds like a whole lot of people are interested in that one. So um, my first choice would be the area. Hey, Tran. Yeah, thanks, Megan. Um, one thing that comes to mind immediately for me that's not related to the subcommittees is more of the Brown Act. I'm sure Mark, uh, Lawrence, Fred, you all will get back at some point about maybe the, the potential, I guess, conflicts that might occur associated with that. So yes. just throwing it out there again. Yes. Um, great. Uh, for me, uh, I think it's pretty apparent now we're getting to the, the point where different camps, there's different camps as to what, the, what directs the conversation, right? So with this particular discussion, I'm more along the camp that once a framework is established, everything else kind of sorts itself out and accordingly. Um, I guess for those reasons, my preferences would be the governance structure and the timing of elections um, as to uh, subcommittee participation. Thank you. Next commissioner. Veronica Amador. Great, thank you. And I think just like everybody else said, I think accountability representation and inclusion shouldn't be its whole. I think it should go in hand with government structure, timing of election, and that should be also another one of the questions that's being asked and proposed um, on the proposal template um, around the equity implications. Um, and then uh, I think for me, I really struggle with the three of them. I can't give a definite answer. Um, but I am really in favor of putting accountability, again, representation and inclusion on the other two, um, or to put it as a draft template question under the equity implications. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Yong Zhao. Um, I would be interested in the governance structure. That would be my first choice. And uh, I am also interested in accountability. That was the last commissioner. Um, Fred, if you'd like to, to speak. Thank you so much. Okay, um, we are, this is really helpful. And I know this is um, just the beginning of our conversation. Uh, Mark, you have your hand up. Did you wanna say something? I'm sorry, that was from when I raised my hand the prior time. Okay, 
Um, want to make sure you're included. Um, so appreciate your thoughts. And I don't think these are exclusive categories. So listening tonight will help us to start to formulate what these committees could look like. Certainly, if you're looking at governance, accountability has to be part of that discussion. If you're looking at representation, certainly that's going to be in the district, the timing of election. So yes, they're going to all be interactive. What I'd like to be able to figure out is what are the different areas of recommendations so that, you know, as I say, a number of, of subcommittees might be in these different areas. If these are the wrong areas, we'll, we'll make those adjustments. But really wanted to hear from everyone just in terms of where you are right now and kind of what we do need to do next. We do have two, I think, very important study sessions to go, um, both in the San Diego model of the transition to a strong mayor. I think that will help us to kind of think that through. Uh, and the Detroit piece is also important in the sense that I think it has the strongest um, charter review commission that looked at the issues of, of equity and inclusion and diversity um, in the Detroit model. So. I, I'm not saying that the study sessions are over, so I really want to make sure we're, we still have some work to do in these different areas. Uh, commissioners have asked for the Office of, uh, our own Office of Cultural Relations, I'm sorry, cultural, I don't know the correct title. Racial equity. Uh, racial equity uh, in, this, in our city, so that's why they're coming, and if you have specific questions, it'd be helpful if you send those to Lawrence so they can address them, but they are coming directly as a uh, request to the commission in terms of what the city's position and the city's office is looking at in their work that they're doing as they start this new office. So there's a lot more to come in that area. And I wanna make sure folks remember that there's still a lot more discussion to have before we get into this. We're trying to do this now so that we can start organizing as we continue to study and then move into um, getting some work uh, created so that the commission has more to talk through. Um, so appreciate your, your thoughtfulness tonight. Um, and I'm going to ask for any public comment. At this we have one hand from Commissioner Callender. I'm sorry, I did not see Yes, that. Mr. Chairman, just, just a quick point of information. And I don't know that the clerk's office is even ready to answer it, but the exercise that we just went through, do we have a sense of, does any one of those three subcommittees have a quorum or have beyond a quorum? Um, they probably will, but I'm, I'm not worried about that um, in the sense that I'm going to break up those subcommittees into smaller groupings to see if we'll work on that so we know what core emissions are. Um, we're also going to meet, we'll, when we do the division into subcommittees, we'll be very careful to uh, delineate what communication looks like so that we don't violate Brown Act, not by the quorum of a meeting, but the quorum of conversation and having a serial meeting. So. I'll give really specific directions from the city attorney on that. So we'll we'll take care of the quorum issue for you and we'll give you strict direction around communication so that we um, make sure that we are as transparent as we can be as, as a commission, as well as efficiently get the work done. So I appreciate that. We cannot, all you did tonight in the straw poll gave us who kind of the areas, but we're gonna have to break those up because otherwise I think we'll have Quorum issues on all on all three of those. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'll look to you for your leadership on it. <laughs> the other thing I'll add is that, uh, as mentioned, you know, we really do want to use the proposals that came out of uh, mayor and council from last summer, as well as the topics that you have all raised. So uh, I'm going to do my best to to get that list together before our next meeting, so that we can use that to inform further breaking out subcommittees into a size that does not, uh, you know. Um, uh, affect Brown Act or, or even get close to Brown Act, you know, while also being some logical groupings that uh, allows for a conversation that reflects the overlap of the categories as best as we can, recognizing that <laughs> dividing things into uh, in parts uh, conflicts with the, the ability to be whole. So there's a, a general tension that we're, we're creating by the very uh, nature of creating subcommittees, but we're doing, doing our best to, to, to thread the needle there. Thank you, Chair. All right, let's um, go to the public for public comment on this item first, and then we have public comment on items not on the agenda. First speaker. First speaker is Alina. Hi, commissioners. Um, so two areas that I would like to add is section X, which is uh, commissions as a whole. And from all of you participating right now, you can see 
that is not very inclusive, is not very equitable, we're not really reaching the community. And so how commissions function as a whole, I think should be looked at. And so when we talk about systemic change, you know, this is an area that we can get into the details and really kind of figure out how do we get more people in, how do we engage them and how do we have this conversation. Second is community engagement and enabling specifically civic participation. And so it's not on here. And also I'd like to point out that it's a little bit odd to see on the agenda that you have these other items listed and then you have others as equity and inclusion and like is that what you think of it is like this is the other stuff that's not as important and so I'd really like to be mindful that you know everybody here at the very first meeting when you did a round robin and introduce yourself and why you're serving everybody spoke on equity and inclusion and so I think that it's really important that we don't other it and that we really prioritize it thank you next speaker Claire Beekman uh, hi. Uh, to begin, uh, it's my guess that uh, the minutes process that was approved at the beginning of the meeting, if I want to talk about that minutes in the future, uh, I can talk about it at this time at Old Business, or if the letters from the public that is in the beginning of the agenda. Um, with that said, just to kind of go over uh, what you're talking about tonight, it really sounds like you're working on, uh, you know, the, the, that the mayor, it, because of the city charter, simply doesn't have much guidelines of exactly what his role is. And it's sure going to be your jobs to figure that out a bit uh, in the coming weeks. And the strong, you're gonna start to really go into the strong mayor stuff for the next month or two, it sounds like. It sounds like other people are saying tonight, it's simply a matter that the charter, there's a few guidelines that the mayor needs to have and direction of, of what sort of uh, ways he can better manage, you know, legally, basically. He, he, he's, he, he's managing right now in, in kind of an arbitrary framework. Work on those terms, that's the refinement and subtlety that, that addresses the city council and the community. That's my key work that I wanna work on and focus on committee meetings, subcommittee meetings. And that you address um, the ideas of, of what I tried to say before, community and council. That's the way I want to talk about the council city manager process. How that all comes back to strong mayor ideas to back to the city council. How do they vote on the subject matter? Uh, how can they vote on, on, on mayor ideas? I think that's an important concept. Um, so thank you for your time. Uh, I, I, I hope that uh, you consider uh, language uh, interpretation ideas. I will talk about that in public comment. And to quickly ask, is this the commission that's gonna decide if the mayor gets an extra two years? Do I have some, someone, can someone answer that for me? Thank you, next speaker. Roland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and very briefly, um, this is for the people who are gonna be, you know, going into, um, you know, separate, discussions about the the timing of the election and there's one thing i want to come in there's one thing i want to communicate to you is that if you go for a six-year term you're basically going to be delaying addressing the problem that you're trying to address which apparently is some kind of a, a apparent equity issue by another six years and not only not only that you're actually going to be electing somebody for the next six years that will not. I'm um, getting some kind of background here. Could somebody please mute themselves? The, the issue, the issue that you're going to be causing here, is that these people that you basically try to get engaged into the election process will not will not be at the table when you elect the next mayor for the next six years. I hope that made sense. Thank you. That was the last public speaker on the work plan. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, our next item is um, anyone in the public wishing to address us on an issue that's not on our agenda tonight? First speaker. Blair Beekman. Hi, Blair Beekman. Thanks a lot for the meeting and the process. Um, 
you know, to, to begin, I, I hope you can work on language interpretation issues. Uh, I think it's just an issue to really consider. We can have Zoom meetings, I feel, where you can ask either, uh, you know, city government or people at San Jose State to do the job for like a hundred bucks an hour and, and ask union representatives to ask to work for that ideas. And please ask someone to mute themselves uh, at this time while I'm speaking. Um, you know, there, there's, this, there's this English only vex that we have on us that, you know, I guess since the mid eighties, we got to learn to talk our way through that. And I think we are just be aware of that concept and that it's so much more important to work towards everybody having a fair shot and it gives everybody opportunity, mental health. If you have a more uh, inclusive language for all, you know, language interpretation can be open to everyone. That's an important concept to learn. There's democratic principles that um, have to be part of the accountability bucket of policing, equity, you know, uh, that, that you need to work on. Democracy is really going to be coming around uh, in, by 2025, individual forms of democracy, not a, a democracy as a republic, but as the, as the individual. There's really important work happening that I hope uh, you learn to check out and to also offer it's quite possible we may be having a, a large earthquake, you know, in the next five years. Uh, I don't know if that's accurate, but but confer with each other with Brown Act ideas. Is is that possible, and how will that be affecting your decisions at this time? I feel in the next five years after 2025, that's when we really start going, and things are going to really be happening towards something incredibly positive and hopeful. And uh, we'll plan for that. Plan for democracy. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Sorry, Cynthia in public. Hi, um, I'm Cynthia in public back. Hello, Council Humans. Um, I'm very pleased to be here again. Uh, I wanted to address something that hasn't been covered. It's been slightly covered, but it's just homelessness in San Jose. Um, we are one of the largest cities in, in California. We have one of the largest homeless encampments in the nation. And I don't think enough has been done to address it. As we've seen with the COVID-19 pandemic, um, if we let things go unaddressed, they just get worse and worse and worse. Um, we saw a rampant amount of COVID deaths within our homeless camps and among our unhoused uh, citizens. And I'm just wondering, like, rather than trying to, there's been a lot of initiatives in the past that go aim to clean up the encampments of that, that is just throwing away their stuff, but is not giving them any resources for, um, you know, um, either permanent or temporary resettlement, any like food or um, hygiene products, right? Things that they actually need to keep themselves safe and to be able to live in this world as people with dignity. So rather than, you know, try to attack the problem, like, sorry, rather than try to attack the symptoms, I actually urge the committee to like find ways of like tackling income inequity, as well as find new ways to reduce our homelessness, right? Because at the root of this is, you know, displacement, it is um, high housing costs, it is low wages. This is what causes it, and also lack of mental health resources. Um, this also ties into defunding the police potentially, but how can we as a, um, city come together to take care of those that are the most vulnerable. And I think that's something that is very pertinent to a lot of the conversations today is that something to center in a lot of our conversations regarding uh, whether we are restructuring our government or whether we're coming up with a new constitution or coming up with new subcommittees. Thank you. Thank you, next speaker. Cynthia was the final speaker. Thank you. Um, thank you, commissioners, for being here with us tonight. I'm going to adjourn us to our next meeting of the Charter Review Commission, which is May 3rd, um, and appreciate all your thoughtful comments tonight. Um, have a good week, and we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.